Well, good morning. My name is Daryl Oswald, and I'm a technician for the Burley County Soil Conservation District. On behalf of the sponsors of this event, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, Dakota Prairies, RC&D, the Morton County Soil Conservation District, and the Burley County Soil Conservation District, I would like to welcome you all to this soil health workshop, Building the Soil Health Foundation the theme chosen for this event. It's good to see so many familiar faces here today, as well as some new faces. Many of you have traveled long distances, and that fact serves to remind us how important building the Soil Health Foundation is. We are delighted to have you here to participate and share in this learning opportunity, because you must first have a solid foundation to move forward in the arena of soil health. We are extremely glad today to have Paul Yaza with us. Paul is an extension engineer at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Paul develops and conducts educational programs related to crop production that improve profitability, build soil health, and reduce risks to the environment. Also included on our agenda is our farmer rancher panel. The panel together will cover the five soil health principles. They are a diverse group of individuals and as we hear about their five operations, they will talk about some of the same soil health principles which shows that there is more than a single way to apply these principles. Many times as farmers and ranchers on our operations, we might be applying one or two of the soil health principles. I believe it is imperative that we acknowledge that soil health requires a systems approach. We should be applying as many soil health principles as feasible to move towards the systems approach. Jay Fuhr, soil health specialist with NRCS of North Dakota, will discuss the soil health principles further during lunch. And he will also be the moderator for our producer panel. Also with us today, set up for an educational opportunity, is the Bismarck Soil Survey Office, headed by Perry Sullivan. They have with them today, if you look in the back, the display of the Web Soil Survey. The Web Soil Survey now has some soil health to tools excuse me, for users which have been added. The web soil survey is one of the best tools that NRCS has put together. You will also see on your table a flyer for a planter clinic being held tomorrow, March 2nd, at the Minokin Farm. The start time is 10 a.m. with lunch and we will wrap up about 2 p.m. Paul Yaza will lead this event. The event is sponsored by the Morton County SCD and the Burley County SCD. At this time, I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, and acknowledge some of the supervisors for Burley County. We have uh, one Burley County supervisor here this morning, is David Bauer, sitting right here in front. And also with us from Morton County is uh, Aaron Steckler and Rocky Bateman, who are also participating on the panel. Uh, if you'd like to participate in the clinic, clinic tomorrow, let Cindy, myself, Jay, or any other staff member know if you would like to attend. Uh, this will be a hands-on, informal event so we encourage you to attend. Also, this morning with us are some of Bismarck State College students who are attending the workshop. They will be here uh, during the morning and afternoon, and they will be moving in and out uh, of the back area. We are glad to have them here and uh, have them able to share in this learning opportunity. Now for some housekeeping items. 
Lunch will be promptly at noon, and we will be serving uh, the lunch actually to the east, past the hanging out airplane, and it's called Collaboration Room 217A. Uh, then we will carry our lunch back into here, and then we will have lunch. Uh, the, le the restrooms, as you might have seen, uh, there's a set right out here, uh, right to the east, and then there's some further to the east, uh, just outside the door. Uh, one thing I would remind too, that this is a non-smoking campus, and if you are going to smoke, you must be in your vehicle. And as a courtesy, if you could please put your cell phones on vibrate, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Following the question and answer segment with our participants, we'll be having an ice cream social uh, this will be a great opportunity to mingle, uh, network, and further discuss the happenings of the day of, of, of what you've seen and heard. Uh, I would ask you today to prepare yourself to be challenged, excited, and think outside the box. Uh, the, again, I would like to say once more, on behalf of our sponsors, welcome uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here today. Uh, without further ado, I'll, uh, we'll move into our first speaker, uh, Paul Yaza. Paul Yaza, uh, as I mentioned, is an extension engineer with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he develops and conducts educational programs related to crop production that improve profitability, build soil health, and reduce risk to the environment. He received both his BS and MS degrees in agriculture engineering from the University of Nebraska and has been working with planting equipment and tillage assistant systems evaluation at the university since 1978. So he does have a lot of, lot of experience. With Paul's experience gained from research and extension activities, he has become, become one of the best sources of information in the Midwest on no-till planting equipment and systems management. Paul admits if there is a mistake to be made with no-till, he's either made it himself or he has seen it done. More importantly, he has learned from those mistakes and shares that information in presentations that stress the systems approach and the long-term benefits of continuous no-till. At this time, I give you Paul Yazan. Thank you, Daryl, and thank you to all the hosts and sponsors for bringing me up here. I've done a couple of meetings in Bismarck before, and I will admit, I have one slide in my presentation. It was only taken about eight miles north of town on a field day I was at many years ago. Uh, as Daryl said, I've been working at the university since 78. I tell people I'm too lazy to look for a different job. As long as they keep paying me, I'm going to keep showing up. Uh, this is actually a J slide he's going to talk about later, but I'll just leave it up here just for an opening comment. When it comes to the five steps pictured here, the five principles, I have been working a lot with NRCS where a lot of the NRCS people only use the first four. They don't integrate the livestock. Well, in our university research where I'm, where I'm at, we don't have livestock either. And so I'm gonna talk a lot about other people's livestock. And I, thought, I was telling Ken, I think the one picture I got of cows, I think he took even. And so again, uh, we'll talk about several different concepts here. But when it comes to no-till, on the program here, Jay put down that I was gonna talk about uh, planting equipment, and getting stands, and all sorts of problems there. I'm gonna talk about the systems approach to crop production. And so again, it's uh, gonna be focusing on the planting equipment some. And this cable likes to fall out, I found out. But no-till planting equipment, uh, adjustments, the operation. I found out the majority of the operation, you have to refer back to the systems approach. You gotta think about how everything affects the next thing in the field. And so it's gonna be far more than just planters I'm gonna talk about. You know, proper crop rotation is a key. Got pictured here, uh, cool season grass, wheat up in the corner, uh, cool season broadleaf, uh, field peas there, warm season grass, corn down in wheat stubble, 
a cool or a warm season broadleaf, the soybeans there. You know, ideally you'd like to have all crop types in your rotation. Now to be truthful, you guys up here have more flexibility because you've got some more cool season stuff that you work with as well as the warm season. In Nebraska, the corn, typical corn soybean country, we see a lot of the corn soybean rotation. Technically that's not a rotation. That's an oscillation if you're just bouncing back and forth. Rotate, you need at least three things, prefer four things, put in cover crops, maybe it's five or six things. But rotation, as the name implies, has that rotation to give you diversity. And again, that's one of the key components when you start thinking about soil health principles, diversity out there. And Mother Nature likes diversity. If you don't have it, Mother Nature will help provide it for you. And that's primarily in weeds we see that. If I've got uh, warm season grasses, warm season broadleaves like corn soybean in Nebraska, we've got cool season mare's tail showing up as a weed and it's become Roundup resistant. So again, we start thinking about diversity, start thinking that, again that systems approach, have them all in there. Now to be truthful in Nebraska, that warm, or the cool season broadleaf, we're a little lacking on that. We've got guys in western Nebraska that like the peas, they use that as a swing to get to wheat in the fall. We've got some guys who have a lot of livestock who love the peas because they come off early enough they can put in some covers for grazing. And so again, we're seeing some changes there as we're getting away from the corn soybean. Now, a lot of times I ask a farmer in Nebraska, what's their rotation? They say, I'm continuous corn. That's obvious, that's not a rotation. Wheat fallow is not a rotation. Wheat fallow is actually worse because I've got a dormant year as well. So again, we've got to think about proper crop rotation, think about the livestock. And again, I think, Kenny, I think you might get photo credit on this, but again, livestock, bring that in the operation helps. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna use cover crops and graze that. My opinion, that now is a forage crop. I treat that different than a cover crop that's out there to build soil. I have a separate hour long presentation on how I manage cover crops, sorry, I don't have time for all that one as well. But again, if I'm gonna raise some beef, I'm gonna make sure I'm raising some vegetation to feed the beef. And that means there's gonna be treated different. It might be a higher seeding rate, it might be some fertilizer applied, it might be a lot more water use applied. So again, for me, grazing, that's a different thing than a true cover for building the soil. Now, again, we're blessed that NRCS rules or a lot of soil conservation district rules allow the grazing. That gives us opportunity for income. We're gonna hear more about that from the farmer panel this afternoon. But again, when I start thinking about what I've been doing through the years, uh, 1978, my master's thesis was plant performance in different tillage systems. Think back to 78, the equipment we had then, the lack of herbicide products we had, the lack of genetics, things like that. I learned a no-till when Roundup was $100 a gallon. I don't like Roundup. I don't have Roundup resistant weeds because I don't use much Roundup. Oh, you wait a minute, I love Roundup ready beans. That's what these are. But again, too many people have gotten taken in by trying to make things simple. We put down an early pre-plant herbicide, reined in and activated, we plant in a weed-free environment, we use post-emergence depending on what weeds are there. And my corn bean rotation on the narrow rotations, I might have seven or eight different modes of action by the time we go through the complete rotation. This is actually a set of pictures from a set of plots uh, that I established back in 1981 when I got hired on full-time after my dissertation. And at that time, I was comparing different tillage systems. There's six different tillage systems at that time doing a grain sorghum soybean rotation. A few years later, I changed it to a corn soybean rotation because that's what's popular. And you can see uh, on the left side of the screen, I gotta use my pointer here because I got too many screens to point at with a laser. Left side of the screen, I got soybeans in the tilled system. There's some soybean seeds laying in dry soil. There's some soybeans trying to emerge through a crust. There's some soybeans that just aren't gonna grow. Compared to the other side where it's no tilled in that grain sorghum residue, every bean seed is up and growing. It was in good moisture. It's protected the residue on top. I love the no-till system. Started working with that, like say 1981, that entire research farm was converted to no-till about 86, 87. Our farm manager got hired away into a larger university farm. And when he got hired because of our no-till success, in a couple years he changed over 3,000 acres to no-till. But again, we like the no-till system. Now when it comes to that no-till system, again, the systems approach is important. And just to throw up uh, 2015, here's the six different tillage systems. With CC, there's with cover crop. Originally, that was with row crop cultivation. Because again, back in 81, we didn't have herbicides. So I was doing no-till with cultivation, without cultivation. 2007, I said, we're always cultivating anymore. I'll throw in cover crop treatment instead. And when you look across those yields on the corn in particular, and all the, uh, I gave us some yield there with the cover crop. And a lot of farmers say, why are you using the cover crop? It didn't pay. I look at them and say, look at the tilled ones. Why are you doing tillage? It didn't pay. 
I'm actually building soil structure, building soil health. In a corn bean rotation, dry land production, southeast Nebraska, when the, those crops get harvested that late in the fall and I put a cover crop out there, I don't have enough growing time to do a lot of good. Majority of the cover crop work I do is into wheat stubble where I've got a lot longer growing period. Or it's after pea harvest, or it's after corn silage where things are cut off earlier, we got more time to grow the covers. The soybeans there, likewise, uh, after about the first couple years when I learned to no-till, no-till's always on top, till's always on the bottom. 2016 yields, the no-till was about 227. This is dry land production 10 miles east of Lincoln. Yes, we were blessed with rain these last couple years. Things worked out pretty good. The beans this year went 65. Again, I like that. The tillage, uh, about after the fifth year, tillage has never been on top when it comes to yield. Now, after telling you I do good, again, Daryl says if there's a mistake to be made. 1981, this is the first year of those plots. That first year, this is planting grain sorghum. And I was the young engineer saying, I'm gonna work with equipment planters. Uh, Case IH just came out, and actually it was international at that time, with the Early Riser Planter. The Early Riser was new and innovative, designed for no-till. John Deere had trouble saying the word no-till. Now, for my master's thesis, I had these two planters. I also had a white seed boss, had a buffalo uh, slot planter, had an Ellis Chalmers 333 no-till special, and I found out the majority of the planters worked better in no-till than they ever did in tilled especially the Buffalo and the Alice, because the way they drove their seed metering, firm soil and no-till actually worked better. And these plots, uh, I showed you earlier, they're 12 rows wide, they're 75 feet long. Back in 81, that was a big plot. Today, I like full length field passes. These are small plots, but it's pretty hard to change the project midway. But again, here's planting grain sorghum. 1981 was a, almost a drought year for us. Grain sorghum, southeast Nebraska at that time was planted out in June 1. At that time, if there was a recipe for no-till, it was coming out of Kentucky. Over there in the Appalachians where they said, you don't do anything till planting time. Your first trip was with the planter, put the seed in the ground with the fertilizer. Second trip is you spray your herbicide with some more liquid nitrogen, perhaps, and you have burn down and you have your residual. Third trip to your combine. That sounds great, doesn't it? Well, first trip, here it is. The planters worked fine in 1981. Everything since then has been an improvement. That's the good news. The bad news is there is no recipe. Recipe at that time, that second trip, liquid nitrogen with your burn down herbicide with your residual herbicide in a drought year, these weeds are already going dormant. Burn down herbicides don't work on dormant weeds, especially when they're that big. There's a reason the herbicide label says two to four inch tall weeds when they tell you the rate. They don't say two to four foot tall weeds. Spray them young. Now, the other thing is, no rain coming, the residual herbicide didn't get activated. So I had weeds all season long. And with no rain, take the nitrogen, liquid nitrogen went this way. The three trips, the saved, I didn't have to combine the grain sorghum. This is a three-year grant. I go, okay, I can't do this. So we sprayed to kill the weeds with Roundup, a quart, another quart. Remember, this is when it was $100 a gallon. I was already $75 into zero yield, just so I could do second year no-till. Second year no-till, I says, what if I spray my herbicide back there a month before planting, get it rained in and activated, because the chance of rain there is better than June 1. And we've actually pushed our grain sorghum planting date up. We try to have all our corn, grain sorghum, soybeans planted by May 1 in an area of the state where the typical starting planting date is April 20th for the corn. Typical starting date for beans is like May 10th, we we're trying to be done by May 1. Herbicide rained in and activated. I'm not using Roundup Burndown in front of my crop, my spring planted crops. So again, we learn never let weeds get ahead of you. Make sure I've got a plan there in place. With corn, bean, wheat, and grain sorghum rotation, like I say, I got about eight different modes of action. I'm not worried about herbicide resistance. So again, you start thinking the systems approach. Key is, I found out, you own your own sprayer. I don't care if it's self-propelled or pull type, but you need to have control of when those herbicide applications are going on, and more important, if you need fungicides and insecticides. We recommend scouting. We don't do preventative treatments. You do scouting, if you have a problem, go out and treat it when it comes to insecticides and fungicides. And the good news is, I don't use them. With a crop rotation diversity, I don't need them. But with the herbicides, by the time you see that weed that's, like say, the label says two to four inches tall, 
it's really about six inches tall. By the time you get around to calling a co-op, it's a foot tall. By the time they get around getting to you, it's two foot tall. And then you want to save money, and so you tell them to spray that light rate for the two inch tall weed. That's where we've taught weeds herbicide resistance. We're giving them a flu shot or vaccination, whatever you want to call it. I say own your own sprayer, keep on top of it. I like early pre-plant herbicides, reined in and activated, I like planting in weed-free environments. So again, think systems approach. Again, when you start thinking about systems approach and tilly systems, there are a variety of tilly systems out there, you know, ranging from the moldboard plow. I grew up in Northeast Nebraska, my dad moldboard plowed, I thought it was great. Got pulled out of high school to sit on the tractor to disc it down. Why? It was a non-uniform seed bed, plowing rough land, you had to smooth it up, you had to make it more uniform. Well, everybody went away from the plowing in our area back in the 70s and fuel prices went up and kids went away to college. Well, we went to reduce till systems. We spent money rather on secondary tillage on improved minimum till tools. But again, companies spent a lot of money trying to make things more uniform. How do I make a one pass tillage tool to make a uniform seed bed? I find out the most uniform seed bed is the no-till seed bed, where I haven't screwed it up. Mother Nature doesn't do tillage, things grow. Once you get the soil working with you, I love the no-till system. And again, the no-till planter over here on this side, a lot of people think that's the starting point. No, that might be five or six down the list when you start thinking about correcting soil problems when it comes to a residue distribution, when it comes to correcting your crop rotation, when it comes to other things out there. And one of the key things is, like I say, it's uniform planting conditions there, but look in front of this equipment. Uniform height of residue, uniform spread of residue. I like uniformity every day of the year when I look at my fields. It makes it a lot easier. It's gonna give you your maximum yield. What you want is uniform competition. Each plant growing has uniform competition for the nutrients, the water, the sunlight, everything it needs for crop growth. That's gonna give you your best yields. And so again, think uniformity every day of the year. And again, here's one of our fields already planted. A lot of people look at that and say, well, don't you need run residue movers? I go, why? Right now, every seed is under the same residue cover in the same soil temperature in the same soil moisture. That's gonna give you your most uniform growth. So that's what I want. Well, when it comes to uniformity, where'd the combine run the year before harvesting the soybeans? If you can see that in your residue spread, you don't have uniformity. You need to spread the residue uniformly. And again, a lot of people don't think too much of that little pile of residue hiding there on the axle. I don't think too much of it either when it falls off and it plugs up the drill, the fertilizer rig, the planter. Majority of the residue handling problems people have at seeding time is they didn't handle the residue at harvest time. And again, think in systems approach, think how whatever you're doing now, how it's gonna affect the next steps. You know, even if you're doing tillage, you got non-uniform distributed residue out there, one tillage pass may not break up that pile of residue compared to where there is no residue. By the time you do the second pass, you've really destroyed the soil. So again, spread the residue out. When it comes to uh, platform headers I, and stripper headers, definitely you want chaff distribution. This combine does not have a chaff spreader on. It's got a chopper on. A lot of people like the choppers because it breaks up the residue, opens it up so it's exposed to soil microbes so the residue can cycle faster. I hate a chopper because it breaks open the residue, opens it up and exposes it to the soil microbes. It breaks down too fast when you got a biology active system. We got rid of the choppers years ago. We spread the residue full width. As far as the chaff spreading, this combining soybeans here, we got a windrow of pods. We got a little blank spot there, another windrow of pods. Next spring planting corn, it's two different soil temperatures, two different soil moistures. What do you do? Oh, we got some guys say, well, I buy these residue movers from my planter, I kick out that residue and make it all the same bear. Well, wait a minute, you got a 12 row planter, these residue movers cost three to $500 a row, $3,600, or you can spend $1,500 for a chaff spreader. Your money ahead solving the problem at the source at the combine, rather than trying to put a bandaid on it on the planter. So again, think systems approach, spreading that residue out. And again, industry is a little behind. We had aftermarket companies adding things. This is a straw storm, a chaff storm. Uh, it came out of Canada, it really does a nice job of spreading. When you look at that wheat stubble, it's all uniform height. You don't see windrows or residue, you spread everything out. Now this producer could do one thing a little different. You notice the wind is blowing this residue toward me. Fortunately, that one's blown away from me. When you have windy days, combine on the downwind side of the field. So that's the wind helps spread the residue. And as it's doing that then, it's not gonna cover up 
the next pass of the crop. That's what's happening here. He's blowing it over on the next pass. He's going to actually have to spread more residue in the next pass because he's carrying some over. Now, heaven forbid, combine catches fire. This one's going to take it into the standing crop. If you're on the downwind side, it takes it away from your standing crop. So again, little things start to add up and you start thinking about spreading residues. Things start thinking about uniformity. But again, a lot of guys like the stripper header. The stripper header, you don't have to spread the residue. You're spreading just the chaff, basically. Stripper header leaves that residue anchored and attached, standing upright. We have a lot of producers who say, I love that. As such, I hate covers because why would I knock that residue over? I'll talk more about that later. But again, think about uniform residue distribution. One of the keys is uniform stands. I've got residue growing everywhere. And again, if I don't, Mother Nature will grow something for you. And you've all seen that. Skip in the field, that's where you got the weeds. Your own lawn or garden, you got to skip, that's where you got the weeds. Uniformity everywhere, every day of the year. And again, here's a field over by Martin, South Dakota. The day I was there, the producer was planting sunflowers into that strip headed wheat stubble. The uh, stripper header left wheat straw nice and long. There's some places you can still see it's long, other places it's laid down. Well, when it comes to shading the soil, keeping the soil moisture in, I like flattened residue. I hate flattened residue in spring planting time when that thunderstorm is coming, the soil gets wet, and you need to finish planting that field. Flattened residue, when can you get back in that field? I love residue standing upright, anchored, attached, where air can move down to the soil surface. Stripper header, we've got some guys in Nebraska that tried it for a year or two or three, and then went away from them because that first snowfall that came that was heavy and wet with wind, everything went flat. And that residue, once it has a lot of biological activity underneath, the roots are rotted off, and that long residue can start moving on you. They've gone back to a platform header where they can leave it anchored and attached, standing up, and they've gone to cover crops to help feed the soil biology so that residue doesn't break loose as fast. But again, on this producer, got rid of the residue movers because, again, we've got some wheat straw that's out there that long. The residue mover turns and wraps. So again, think about little things adding up. Again, herbicide reined in, activated for sunflowers. Again, our research farm, we've got the silver cedar. We don't run the chopper. Uh, granted, this is a small a combine of this farm. We only have 240 acres of row crops here, but that farm is terraced, designed for six row terraces. So we're limited to that. Our research farm up at Mead, which is about 30 miles north, we are on 16 row equipment there. We've got a 20 foot combine head. Now, when you get the narrow heads, it's easier to spread full width. The good news is industry's given us full width spreading now on the larger heads. John Deere Power Board, for instance, I can get residue spread out. So again, spread that residue out, anchored attached, and I prefer to cut it as tall as I can because I don't want it touching the soil until it absolutely has to. And again, it's because our soil biology is getting so high. Anchored and attached when the cedar hits it, planter in this case, I don't have to cut the residue. If it's anchored and attached, as they hit it, the soil will hold it as I pass across it. Again, that's what I prefer. Usually we cut our residue about toolbar height, such that hoses, wires, cables, and chains are all protected because the residue is a little shorter than that. And again, that works out quite well for us. We get the air movement down to the soil surface because there isn't a mat of residue there. The planter flattens some residue, yes, but at that time, the seed's already in the ground. I want flattened residue absorber and drop impact. Now, if you're from further west, maybe you want standing residue to break up the wind so you don't have wind erosion problems. So again, you gotta be careful when you start hearing about what somebody's doing. Do they have a water erosion problem, or raindrop impact? Do they have a wind erosion problem? Do they have blowing sands, as we do in our sand hills? Again, that tells you how you're gonna leave your residue. And even for us, spring planted versus fall planted. Fall planted wheat, I like standing residue there to catch snow to reduce winter kill. Spring planted, I like flattened residue because we get spring thunderstorms. So again, there's no one answer fits all, depends what's going on. For corn harvest, I don't need a chaff spreader. We're lazy, we don't pull it off. This is actually a producer I worked with the year I took this picture. He is center pivot irrigated corn. He had seven pivot average at 265 bushel per acre. He's been no-till in about 20 years. He's on slopes, that's why he needs the no-till. But what's interesting is that big cat combine there, about 265 bushel corn going through it. If you look close, it's actually 18, 20 inch rows going through there. Look how little residue's coming out the back. If your corn head is doing the right job processing the residue, the snapping rolls are bringing the ears down, snapping the ears off by processing the stalks downward. That's my residue processor. Now I see too many farmers who have problems, and especially with down corn, they put a corn reel on and push all that residue through the combine. I go, why? There's no grain on that stalk other than where that ear is. 
That's why it's called snap and roll. Snap the ear off, don't send the rest through the machine. And again, those are just occasional tassel and the husks, cobs coming out of the back of that combine. The residue's there, processed downward, anchored, and attached. Now yes, the big wide tires runs over a little bit. That grain cart runs over a little bit. But again, that residue is there working for him in the system. Contrast that to this field. Here's the day after harvest, about 90 bushel dry line corn. Harvest of the combine that has snapping rolls that intermesh. Now intermeshing snapping rolls, the first flute hits the stalk, stalk leans this way, next flute hits the stalk, stalk leans this way. And if you got a variety that has weak ear shank, you might get some lateral whip and tossing the ears up the side of the corn head. We all say oh, all you do is raise the head up to reduce that lateral whipping. It does, and if you're just thinking about harvest, that's wise. If you're thinking about no-till, the majority of that corn stalk never saw the snapping rolls because you had the head up higher. It's not been crushed, it's not been opened up. I like that because that stalk's gonna last a lot longer in the field. Someone in their first or second year no-till is gonna hate that because the stalk's gonna last a lot longer in the field. Now you got lazy cows don't like bending over, they like it because they don't have to bend over to chew up stalks. But again, when it comes to processing the residue, the main problem I see here though is he's had a six row combine, and what if he has a 12 row planter? You notice the first pass is leaning toward me here or away from me on this side. The next pass over is leaning the opposite direction. That's because the intermesh of snapping rolls, if the corn stalk couldn't get between the snapping rolls, it leaned the stalk over. And basically it was combing the ears off and that stalk was not processed. Now I start planting with a 12 row planter. As I start planting that way, these first six rows work great. The next six rows, the stalks are leaning into me and every loose hose, wire, cable, and chain just got snagged and torn and you cussed no-till. That's not a no-till planter problem, that's a no-till harvest problem. Combine two passes the same direction, two passes back the same direction, plant the way the stalks are leaning, the problem goes away. And again, little things add up. Now, here's a farmer I met in Kansas. He says, put a lean bar out front. Wind rowers, motor conditioners have lean bars, lean the stuff over to get it in the head. Do the same thing to get it under the planter. It's just hanging from a chain there, it folds with the planter. He's got some weights there to get everything going in the ground. I'm gonna talk about weight a little bit later. He's got a fertilizer tank behind him there. He puts down his nitrogen and all at the same time. He's putting down his starter, his saddles are up on the tractor. And a lot of guys think no-till is gonna be a one-pass system. If you're a farmer like him who has a broad crop rotation, I can get excited about a one-pass system. We got some guys in Nebraska though who are continuous corn under irrigation. Think about a one pass system planting corn. How many days do you have to get corn in the ground before you're gonna take a yield hit because you're planting too late? You might have 20 days in the average spring. How many weeks do you have you could put on your nitrogen fertilizer? We got about 20 weeks. Why would I slow the planter down stopping to fill up the fertilizer all the time, especially under irrigated corn when we're putting out 200, 250 bushel, or 200, 250 pounds of nitrogen for irrigated yield production. Again, you gotta think a systems approach. Fertility is part of that system. The starter, I like indexed to the row. But if I wanna put down three or five gallons and 10 gallons at most maybe, a big tank like that, you can run a lot of acres. So again, think of the system, how it fits together. Now, a broad crop rotation. Maybe I'm planting some spring wheat. Maybe I got some corn, some soybeans. Maybe Milo, you guys are a little far north from Milo, but maybe sunflowers. Then I got some fall planted crops. Now how many days do you plant corn? Well, maybe 20 days is fine, but the other 20 weeks you're busy doing something else. Now one pass system makes sense if you've got a broad crop rotation. So again, think about machinery management. A broad crop rotation, that same planter can now see two, three, four times as many acres. Again, it's smaller. 20 days plant corn, you're going to do only corn, that planter gets huge and sits the rest of the year. So again, think systems approach, machinery management. Now, I do programs all over the country and I went out to Palouse. There's some fields out there you don't want to drive more than once a year. Here's a friend of mine, no tiller. He's putting down his fertilizer, he's carrying in hydrous on the tractor, dry fertilizer, seed. He says, because you don't want to drive the field more often than you have to. He also has a broad crop rotation. He's got uh, peas, lentils, spring wheat, winter wheat, uh, garbanzos, a lot of things in his rotation. You can see with the slopes, you definitely don't want to be out there more than you have to. No-till because of the slopes. You guys ever get a little drowsy going across the field? You see this uh, sort of valley up the middle here? Can't get my pointer to, 
Here it comes. He says the worst one he has is about a 400 foot drop off. So you don't dare fall asleep and go through the fence at the end of the field. But again, a broad crop rotation, a one pass system for planting and fertilizer makes sense. So again, we've got to think about it. But now, what about the tender crew? Can you get refilled? I've seen some guys with a 48 row planter, it takes them half a day to fill up. Now, what's the tender crew doing while he's planting that 48 row planter? He's sitting there waiting. You'd be far better off perhaps with two 24 row planters. Tender crew fills one, he's out planting. Tender crew fills the other, he's out planting. You get one row chain throw off or one bearing seize. 48 row planter, you got zero moving. Two 24s, you got 24 still moving. So again, start thinking about machinery management sets. Start thinking about the support crew. Same thing at harvest time. Do you have enough trucks to haul away, enough bin capacity to take it or elevator or wherever you're going? And you start thinking systems approach. You start thinking different. And again, I'm talking from the engineer side. The soil side, you gotta keep in mind as well. But again, refilling the seed, he's got someone else refilling the anhydrous, someone else refilling the fertilizer here. That's a different rig than I showed earlier. But again, in the Pacific Northwest, you'll see a lot of that kind of operation. Uh, even down here, uh, Horsch Anderson cedars. You know, Michael Horsch being the German industrialist type thinking, bigger is better. Well, if labor is cheap, I disagree. If labor is expensive, maybe bigger is better, but I still need the labor for the tender. Michael says, no problem, you buy a second seed unit back there and you fill that and have the fertilizer and seed waiting for you and all you do is unhook the first one, hook on the second one, and then take their time filling that it back up. Again, spend more money, the system there. Now he's on tracks there for flotation, things like that. Uh, I'm a fan of reduced pressures in the field by having more axles out there. I'm not a real believer in tracks because if I got good soil structure, good roots there supporting my soil, I don't need the extra flotation. Tracks are usually designed for tilled soil conditions where you don't have soil structure. But again, here you gotta have a second tender rather than a crew. Here's a producer in Nebraska planting. He says, you know what? I got plenty of other opportunities I can plant and put on the fertilizer in a separate pass. Now back up one here. There's about 500 horsepower there on a shank cedar because of the tillage he's doing, because of the weight he's handling. And he's only 40 feet wide. Here's 40 feet, 45 feet wide with under 200 horse with less weight to pull around, with less soil disturbance. I can get by a smaller tractor, smaller equipment, less compaction. When it comes to his tender crew, oh yeah, he's still got one. Fills up right back in the field, fertilizer goes on later. So again, think of how the system fits together. Minimal soil disturbance here, crossbuster drill, uh, disc drill rather than shanks. Or again, machinery sets. Here's a producer who says, I like that John Deere air seeder, but I don't do enough wheat to justify owning the air seeder. The dealer says, well, you can plant soybeans too. Well, I'm not sure I do enough wheat and beans to justify that air seeder and a big tractor to pull it. Until he found out, you know what, I can put a little boot on there and put down my anhydrous and that becomes my fertilizer bar for all of my corn ground as well. It says, why own a fertilizer bar? That tractor and that air seed are sitting when it's time to put down his pre-plant first corn. So now again, think of machinery sets, mineral soil disturbance there with that opener. We all have seen the John, the John Deere air seeders, how little soil disturbance there can be. So again, think in machinery sets. It's a one pass system when he's seeding his wheat, he can put down his nitrogen, his ammonium thiosol, his 1034 old starter and wheat seed. When he's putting down fertilizer for the corn, just leaves the wheat seed out. He can still put down even some dry fertilizer in the hopper now. So again, think systems approach. This is one of my favorites, Case International the SDX air seeder. This producer went in to the dealer and says, I want to buy an SDX. And the dealer says, all right, do you want the tow behind cart, the tow in front cart, or the central commodity system? He said, no thanks. Dealer looked at him and says, well, why are you buying an air seeder? He said, it's the best low disturbance opener I found to put down my fertilizer. He's never run a seed through it. This field's already got anhydrous ammonia applied on 15 inch bands with 1034O in the same 15 inch bands, minimal residue disturbance, and again, that's one of the principles, mineral residue disturbance. Again, the capacity he has there, these disc openers can run a lot higher speed. So again, we start thinking systems approach, how does it fit together? Our fertilizer bar, again, we're a small farm, six row equipment. This bar was bought in 1981. 
People always ask me about minimal soil disturbance. I say you can take just about any bar, get rid of the wide chisel point knife, get rid of the coil shank that shakes and does tillage. We went to a rigid shank, we went to a narrow uh, side dress type knife. We put a large diameter colder in front of the knife. The colder runs to cut the residue, yes, but more important, cut the soil. We run the colder at the same depth as the knife. As such, the knife slides through the same slot, doesn't do any tillage. The disc covers back there are set straight, like an old rolling cultivator shield just to hold residue down. The reason we bought disc cover covers is when we do strip till research, we can put a mole knife on there to heave soil, and we use those disc covers to shape the berm, as they call it. For no-till, a lot of times we even take the disc covers off. We don't need to cover because we're not throwing soil out. And when I say we're not throwing soil out, there are five knife marks in that picture, put down in hydrous on wheat stubble. Now, the two way up in the corner, I cheat a little bit. There's three knife marks actually in the picture. That's how mineral soil disturbance we have when we run a colder as deep as the knife with a rigid mounted knife. Now, a lot of people say they don't like anhydrous. It's hard on the soil. The tillage was hard on the soil. Anhydrous itself, that is a nitrogen food source for my crop. It's also a nitrogen food source for the soil microbes. Yes, the day I go through, there's a band there that it's not real healthy for those soil microbes. We put our anhydrous on, actually we put ours on a week ago. So microbes are hardly woke up yet. We're not hurting them too much. By the time they wake up and really start functioning, that anhydrous has dissipated, it's been rained in, it's been spread. We're not seeing problems with some soil microbes. I love anhydrous because it's the cheapest form of nitrogen. It's always injected below the residue so you don't have the residue tie up. It's injected in a non-leachable form. When it changes the nitrate, it can be leachable. But again, think a systems approach. Now, to be truthful, even with that minimal soil disturbance, we top dress our wheat with dry or liquid UAN. We have run it in wheat, doesn't kill wheat. The bad news is we've got 30 inch knife spacing that's too far apart for wheat that's on seven and a half inch rows. You get two rows that look real pretty, two rows that look real sick. So again, think systems approach. Getting back to the cedars, getting back to the lean bars. Here's the producer even filled his lean bar on this air cedar full of concrete just to make sure he knocked over, in this case he had sunflower residue he was planting through. Those stalks are a little bigger. You want to make sure you knocked them on over. Just down the road from you, Marlon Richter's drill. He's got a lean bar out in front of his. Again, lean the residue the same direction you're going. And that's the direction you're cutting. So you don't even have to cut the residue. You're going the same like it's leaned over. Again, this is one of our fields years ago. This is about 200 bushel corn residue the day after combining. It looks a little different than that 90 bushel I showed earlier. Our combine, rather than intermeshing snapping rolls, at that time we had knife snapping rolls. Crimp the stock, pull it down, release the stock, crimp the stock, pull it down, so the stocks are processed, crushed downward. They're laying there on the ground. Our soil biology in the early days of no-till, we loved that corn head, because it processed the residue. Once we got soil biology working for us, we hate that corn head. This is what the field, this is a different field, but this is what it looks like the next spring when you got soil biology. There's 220 bushel corn residue with 25 years of no-till. Soil biology is such I can't keep residue around. We got rid of that corn head, it was processing the residue too much. Again, we went to our silver cedar, we got tapered snapping rolls on there, we run the corn head a lot higher. We took the bottom step off the combine even so we can run higher yet. And again, this is about 200, 220 bushel corn. Look how little residue is coming out the back. Those tapered snapping rolls are processing the corn downward, just husk cobs coming out the back. Think about that again, uniformity every day of the year. I got uniform residue cover there now. And it's up in the air, not touching the soil microbes. When I plant, I'm gonna knock it over to touch the soil microbes to cycle the residue, because you want the residue to cycle when the next crop is growing. Because in that residue, as it cycles, some of the carbon goes in the soil, majority of the residue on the surface, the carbon goes upward in the atmosphere. If your next crop is growing, I've got stomata open looking for carbon dioxide. Plant grows better. They don't have to open as much. Since they don't open as much, they don't transpire as much water out. The crop becomes more water efficient as the next crop is growing and the residue is decaying. The worst thing you can do is get the residue decaying before you got another crop growing. We'll say, well, the next crop's not gonna be growing until next spring. Cover crops can capture that carbon dioxide coming off. So again, we think about systems approach. Again, there's a lot of companies out there trying to sell you something. This happens to be a 
airway here, there was Phillips Heralds, Phoenix Heralds, they came across Nebraska and never took hold. Uh, there's all sorts of vertical tillage tools showing up now. And everyone says, well, you need to process that residue some. Now, Nebraska NRCS put these all in a category where they call them fluffing heralds, because basically that was their argument. You've got a little bit of a mat of residue out there, it's wet underneath, you fluff it, you get the air to dry out underneath, you can get out there and plant, and you don't run it in the fall like this demonstration was. You run it a half day in front of the planter, such that that little wet residue, you fluff it, let it dry out so you can plant. You know what, I'd rather build soil structure so the water soaks in. I'd rather have the residue stand upright and anchored so I don't have the mat of residue. Now running a half day in front of the planter, kid loves it. Dad puts them out there and says, you can drive 10, 12, 15 mile an hour. And a half day in front, what if something happened and it rains two inches that night, when will it dry out under a mat of residue like that compared to where the residue is still standing? I don't like that. In Nebraska, they took this point, if you're using one of these fluffing heralds, you can't qualify for a program that says no-till. That fluffing herald is full with soil disturbance. Yes, it's only this deep. That's exactly the layer you don't want to disturb when it comes to biological activity, what's going on in the interface of air and soil. So again, think about it. I hate cutting residue loose. Here's ridge tail for irrigation. You probably don't have that up here, but again, it shows what happens when you cut residue loose. This is a cotton stump puller, came out of Texas. They said, brought in Nebraska, says you go down the top of that ridge and you cut the heart of that corn stalk out, it's easier to plant on top of that ridge. We ran replicated strips here for two combine passes. There's a little four-row machine just hauling on the trailer, so it looks odd here. But when we plant our no-till on top of the ridge for our fur irrigation, the planter knocks over the residue and it's a uniform seeding. Where we ran that machine, the planter didn't bounce as much because it pulled the root stumps out. But sometimes it left a hole this big from the root ball. Other places had extra residue, some places had detached residue, some places had no residue. Every place we ran it, we lost five to seven bushel per acre because of non-uniform stands. Why would you run an extra trip for non-uniformity? When it comes to non-uniformity, water backed up on this field on us. Didn't need a plot map to know which plots were which. Again, I hate cutting residue loose. Now, it might be wind. Again, cutting residue loose is a no-no. Leave it anchored and attached. When we run for irrigation, you can't get water through that residue dike there. When you get crusting and erosion where there's no residue, again, leave residue anchored and attached working for you. Standing up, catch snow. I heard you guys had a little snow back in December. A <laughs> little bit. When Jay first talked to me, it was after that snow hit. Well, actually about the second time. It was after the snow hit. I said, if it's gone, I'll come. Well, he almost got rid of most of it. <laughs> but again, standing upright, anchored, attached, I want uniform snow cover. Again, think about next spring as that snow melts. Is it going to be uniform soil temperature, uniform soil moisture? You know, too often it's not. If you leave the residue taller, it's going to be a lot more uniform. As you leave residue taller, this is on our own research farm here, that's grain sorghum residue. Now, you might think that's that tall. No, it's not. When you walk up close to that, that's 24 inch uniform residue cover. I love grain sorghum for that because that residue is all standing there. Again, that's uniform moisture. Now, a lot of people look at that and say, well, I want that snow to blow away so that soil warms up quicker in the spring. We have found with no-till, good soil structure, there's heat rises from below. We've got good soil structure, there's no root restricting layer, no water restricting layer. And we actually have our snow banks melt from the bottom and the snow just sort of disappears. Conventional till farmers, they've got some sort of root restricting layer there, maybe a tillage pan, maybe who knows what. Heat doesn't rise from below, and when their snow melts, it melts from the top, and you see runoff coming out of the fields. Just drive, when you're driving around, you know which your neighbors know till long term. You know which ones are still doing tillage. Just watch the snow melt. Watch the water ponding. The odds are the no-tillers, there isn't water ponding. It's soaking in. It's being stored to use later in the season. So again, that's what I'm after. You know, too often I see, you know, a field like this and this side where it's tilled. It's blown away here. That hill knob freezes hard because there's nothing there to insulate it. It actually may stay frozen longer than the snow-covered insulated stuff. Next spring, the knob is dry. Where the deep drift was, it's wet and you can't get through. Well, if I've got standing residue and uniform snow cover, it's going to be far more uniform planting conditions. Again, think uniformity every day of the year. And again, when I say the soil structure, this is a tile spade full of soil from our long-term tillage comparisons. Started the plots in 1981. These spadefuls were taken about after 25 years. 
The one close to me here, or far on this side, is the no-till. Good soil pads, good soil aggregates, that's a tile spade, about that long a soil sample. So loose, part of it fell off the top. The other is from the disc plot. You can see a lot less pore space. You can see a lot less soil aggregates there. You can see how air can't move up, or water can't move in. If you got an infiltration problem, the problem probably is because you got a lack of soil structure because of years of tillage. Now, how fast does that soil structure build? I can honestly say it, it depends. It depends on freeze-thaw cycles. Minnesota did a lot of work on that back in the 70s to get rid of compaction. They say it takes about 15 to 20 freeze-thaw cycles to really open up that soil. Think of the surface layer in a soybean residue covered field. Think of the way this winter's been going. You might already have 10 freeze-thaw cycles on that top layer. By planting time, you may have 15 to 20. That top layer in a soybean residue covered field is real loose and mellow. Corn residue covered field or wheat residue, a lot less. But what about down at tillage pan depth? You might only get three cycles. If I no-till into that this year, I still got a tillage pan there. Pick up another three cycles, four cycles next year. Another year, pick up some more. Talk to someone who's no-tilled for a while, continuous no-tillers, a lot of them will say, something happened after about five years. The soil started behaving different. One thing was, could be the freeze-thaw, finally open things up. Could be wetting and drying. Those soils that crack and open up are doing you a favor when it comes to breaking up soil compaction. The other thing is you can speed it up by having more active roots there, cover crops. You can speed it up by having manure applied, by adding soil biology. You can speed it up a variety of ways. I know a farmer in northeast Nebraska that in about three years of manure with cover crops, with diverse crop rotation, he can make a soil look like it's at least 10 years no-till because of everything he's done different to build the soil system. Too often I get someone who's corn soybeans with tillage, they switch to no-till, Corn soybeans, no tillage. They haven't really changed anything other than take away the soil destruction. They haven't intensified the cropping system to take advantage of the healthier soil system, the water they save with no till. So again, think about systems approach. Now in the program where it says, setting your planner. I'm ready to start my presentation now. <laughs> I kiddingly told Jay last night, we went out to supper, I says, I'm changing my presentation after we had our chat. <laughs> Think about planners. The handout on the table there, you don't have to take complete notes. You can take it home because when you get home, you're going to say, what do you say about that? I'm going to talk general principles. I'm not going to tell you what to buy. I'm not going to tell you what to throw away. I'm going to tell you how we're doing it and why and what I've seen other producers do and why. Here's an old no-till planner back in the 70s, 60s, whatever. Think about planning equipment. First step is going to be cut or handle residue. Second step, whoops, wait, first step is actually meter the seed. I don't even talk about that. You're taking care of your seed meters regardless of your tillage system. The dealer can help you. There's a lot of consultants that will help you on that. When you start thinking about no-tills, the next four steps are the important ones. Cut or handle the residue. Penetrate the soil at desired seeding depth. Establish seed to soil contact, and it is, close, it is different than closing the seed V. Now, there's several companies that will do those two steps together. Now, you may ask for steps five, six, seven, and eight. It might be a fertilizer, it might be insecticide, it might be a herbicide application, it might be a fungicide, you know, who knows. But if you fail on these four, worse yet, fail on the first one to meet the seed, it doesn't matter what the rest of them are. Now, the reason I break down those four is think about those four when it comes to the strengths or weaknesses of any seeding equipment you have. How does it attack each of those four steps? This old 1260 runner planter, the runner couldn't cut the first stick of residue. We put the rolling colder out front, and this is actually a newer colder. The original ones were four inches wide, wavy colders, and they cut that residue like a pizza cutter. The newer ones are two inches wide. The newer ones are one inch wide, five eighths wide, smooth colders, getting down narrower because the wider you were, the more tillage it did. Now, cut the residue. That runner planter was lightweight, could not penetrate the soil. Well, you put the colder out front and get good springs on it, transfer some weight from the hitch of the tractor, transfer whatever. I till and loosen the soil. Wait a minute. I just said till. Well, the good news was it was four inches wide, maybe two inches wide, not full width. We called that colder a no-till attachment. No, it was a tillage attachment to overcome shortcomings in no-till and back. When you actually look at the planters, drills, air seeders in the market today, very few have a colder. 
If they have a colder, it's because someone in the back of their mind says, years ago, we had to put a colder on to make it work. The reason we had to put a colder on, it was not designed for no-till and back. The runners are basically gone when it comes to corn, bean, soybean planters. Now yeah, we still see some runners in vegetable production, things like this, small seed, delicate seed placement. But basically everybody's gone to double disc open. It's the same diameter and sharper than any colder in the market. I don't need the colders. Cut and handle residue, the colder did that. Till and loosen the soil. Penetration is easier, that lightweight runner planter. Establish seed to soil contact. Close the seed V. Again, with that till zone, four inches wide, that planter didn't know it was in no-till. It was easy to get seed to soil contact, close the seed V. Now, when we start thinking about how planters have changed, the big wide press wheel that's not in that picture is gone. We're seeing differences. Now, when I first started doing no-till education programs back in the late 70s, early 80s, Buffalo was out there, Flesher Manufacturing made the slot planter. Everybody knew about that planter, and everybody says, that's the no-till planter. And while John Deere, they had a no-till planter, they just didn't want to tell you that because they were selling you the big tractors and big tillage equipment to go with it. Buffalo didn't sell tractors and tillage. They said, oh, I got a no-till planter. I had farmers like yourself say, well, you're making me buy a buffalo planter. I go, no, I'm not. But again, think of the four steps. I said, the runners are gone. They still got a little short runner there behind a shank. Cutter handle residue. That shank was a dump rake. Put a smooth, straight residue cutting colder in front, not a tillage colder. Penetrate soil desired seeding depth. Well, that shank would suck itself in the way the system it would penetrate desired seeding depth. Establish seed to soil contact. It has a one by 10 wheel right on top of the seed. Close the seed deep. It had discs or tires, depending on which one you bought. And then off the picture here is a herald that actually hid the seed V. You can see the four steps. Now, the guys who had the buffalo planter usually cussed the buffalo planter and the main complaint they had was that little one by 10 wheel. That little one by 10 wheel would pick up the seed and throw it out of the seed V if the soil is wet and sticky. It did because they didn't know how to set the buffalo planter to have it running tail down to firm the soil to press the seed on firm soil. If they were planting too deep, they just shortened the third length of the planter, brought the tail up, they planted shallower, yes, didn't firm the soil, they put a seed on loose soil and that one by 10 wheel picked up the seed and kicked it out of the seed V, they said that tire will never work. I say that now because what's the most popular press wheel there is on the air seeders in the market today? Roughly a one by 10 wheel running right on top of the seed to give you seed to soil contact. They were ahead of the time, just didn't know it. But again, think of the steps. You start thinking about the steps, I say the colders are gone. Double disc openers are sharper than the colders. Now, I show a highlighted area here, about two, two and a half inches of blade contact. Those two discs are sharp working together. As they encounter residue, there's a little tearing action to actually pull the residue apart. That blade contact's not at the bottom of the seed V. Technically, it makes almost a W. We call it seed V. Now, when you actually look close, those blades are not touching clear at the bottom. There's a little gap there. You run them a little longer, they'll have a big gap between them. Think about cutting residue. You now have two cutting edges, which means you got half the weight per blade. You won't cut residue. You also have soil getting between the discs. You're gonna have problems, especially in wet, sticky soils. Make sure those discs are sharp working together. Inch and a half blade contact on the new discs that are thicker, two inches on the old discs. Make sure they're working together. As you move those discs inward, move the depth gauge wheels inward, keep those discs clean as well. So again, think about that. As you put new discs on, this is a close up of the seed tube protector that goes in between the discs, it's in front of the seed tube. As they go in, they flex, they wear, put a new seed tube protector on to hold the discs apart. Too many producers don't do that. There are new seed tube protectors that actually hold the discs apart even better yet. And this is a sketch from a company that actually sells one of those. But if you don't hold the discs apart, they actually flex some. As they flex, you start knocking out bearings. As they flex, you start cracking discs. As they flex, you make a seed V. The original discs had a gap on the bottom, about five eighths inch wide. There's a small place for you to set your seed. Hold those discs apart with good sharp discs, adjust to working together, you get a better seed placement. That's where those extra seed tube guards with thicker blades that don't flex makes a big difference. You've got an older planter. Newer planters, a lot of them are being sold with it or they're being added on. So take care of that planter. Now some companies, Case International started with it. This is the Deutz Ellis. Uh, Landell sells this planter now. Put one in front of the other. They said the first one's my colder to cut the residue. The second one opens up the seed V. Which one's better? They're both the same. It's all in marketing, guys. 
Now, to be truthful, I like one in front of the other in the case international design, because just look at my hands, slide one behind the other, the seed V just got narrower. I get less soil disturbance. I can go in a wetter field sooner than guys with side by side. Now, when you slide one behind the other, now this front one takes a lot more wear, tear, and abuse. Well, Case IH, Deutsch Ellis, went with stronger steel. Takes care of that for you. Some guys say, well, I got a deer. My discs are worn. I'm going to put on one new blade and one old blade, and I'm going to have side by side. Changed over to a leading disc. No, that disc is not strong enough to go that way. It's going to wear fast. You're going to have them side by side. And the bolts where they mount won't work that way because now your depths are different because they're different diameters. Again, side-by-side -side discs replace both discs at the same time. Check your owner's manual how to do that. Even on here, adjust them so they're working together. Now, I don't force inch and a half to two and a half inches of blade contact here. If you do that, the rear disc cuts off the front disc and you got two discs side-by-side. -side. You adjust those so they're just touching so nothing can get between them. And again, properly adjusted, here's what it might look like. Producer I hit who plants right down the old row. And I say, I can't drive that accurate. He says, as that new corn root is going in the ground, it doesn't have to open up the soil because it's following those little channels that are already there. Those channels have nutrients from the corn tied up last year are being released to feed this year's. He says, that residue there is not going to crust. It's not going to wash out if it breaks over a hill. I love planting down the old row. I can't drive that accurate. If you had a residue mover up front, catch that corn root ball and roll it out, or colder the disturbed soil, you couldn't do that. With a double disc opener, open it up, the depth gauge wheels are out here on the side, close it back up after rain, that's what it'll look like. You're amazed what these planters can do. We don't need all these attachments. The industry's given us the no-till without the tillage. Now, like I say, I can't drive that accurate. But when you think about the steps, cut or handle residue, he's doing it. Penetrate soil, desired seeding depth. Too often people say, well, I'm going to bounce over that. I'm not going to get the seed in the ground. That tells me you don't have enough weight on the planter. You don't have enough soil structure there. Believe it or not, long-term no-till, that root bowl, you don't bounce over it. You just squash it down because it's already rotted off from down below. So when it comes to that second step, penetrate soil, desired seeding depth, pay attention to down pressure. Make sure the down pressure springs are on the planter to transfer weight from the toolbar to the row unit itself. Some companies put the weight directly on the row unit. Now, it worked both ways. The research that was done back in the 70s says about the soil disturbance of opening up a seed V that wide, that deep, or running colder, that wide, that deep, it takes five to 600 pounds per row. Well, the old style row units where you carried the seed on there when you're fully loaded, they might have weighed three, 400 pounds. You put on one spring there, it was 90 pounds, two springs is 180 pounds. When the seed box is full, it might work good. When the seed box is empty, you just lost 60 pounds of weight may not work. Rather than 180 pounds, deer's options now, they start at 300 pounds. Their airbag system goes over 400 pounds per row, additional down pressure to your row unit. Pay attention to down pressure. Add that on. Again, depends. The white seed boss originally had colder up front. The little light duty springs, this producer doubled them up. White beefed up their disc openers. They said, we don't need a colder anymore. Those little light springs didn't work anymore. The Agco white package now are four springs that work, it's providing 450 pounds per row available down pressure. Now, as those springs are pulling down on their own unit, they're taking the weight from the toolbar. You gotta do a math problem. Here's Sukup Ridge Cleaners up front. They're looking for 200 pounds per row. The heavy duty down pressure springs in the deer planter are looking for 300 pounds per row. Two plus three is 500. 500 times six row planters, 3,000 pounds. And you can see right here, that that toolbar did not weigh 3,000 pounds. You may have to add weight to get those springs to work. The more rows you got, the more things you got going in the soil, the more weight you're gonna have to add. And again, white with the colders on the toolbar. They had brackets, you put your suitcase weights right on the toolbar to make sure the colders were in the ground. Now, without the colders, the springs are transferred the weight to your row units. Again, weight straight on the toolbar. For safety and stability and transport, I like that. It doesn't hammer on the parallel links in the planter. If I put the weight back here in the row unit, going down the road, puts a lot more stress on the parallel links of the planter. I like the weight up on the frame itself. You got a planter like this one with a folding wing. Make sure you put weight out on the wings. We see a lot of problems now with these central seed hopper planters because there's not enough weight out on the wings as we start getting more down pressure. Central seed hoppers, 
This is a producer down near Gettysburg, South Dakota. This one was 20 inch rows, 32 rows. He now runs 48 20 inch rows. Central Seed Hopper's got plenty of weight there to get that in the ground. Companies are not coming out with weight transfer to get weight moved out to the wings. Auto steer, GPS, make sure you add weight out there that the markers used to provide. Again, that down pressure airbag might say 400 pounds. Take a look at that planter, it doesn't weigh 400 pounds out there in the end per row unit. Add the weight to where you need it. We had some planters in Nebraska where the guys weren't paying attention to weight. It was a little bit dry planting here, not this past year, but the year before. They set the planter in the rows in the center where the central seed hopper and there's plenty of weight there. They had the seed down two and a half inches deep. By the time you get out to the wings, there's not enough weight, they're getting seed about a half inch deep. Added weights out on the end, get it down, make it work. The Max Emerge, I showed earlier in my 1981 photo. This is 1982 when I learned to get the herbicide out, reined in and activated. We're planting our soybeans now, our herbicide's already reined in, we're not planting into weeds. Cutting the grain soybean residue, it's still tilled in the background, we haven't converted the rest of the farm yet. The weight bracket there, those tanks are full of water. 200 gallons of water, 8.34 pounds per gallon is about the same as 300 pounds per row down pressure times six rows. Do that math problem. Side view of that planter, when we bought it, it had colders up front. John Deere said that's our conservation tillage package. They wouldn't call it no-till. And like I say, they had trouble saying the word no-till. Even when the 750 drill came out, they called it the all-till drill. That's a no-till drill. But again, had the bubble colder on there, had heavy-duty down pressure springs in there, and had a decal on the hitch, and they charged it a couple thousand dollars extra. Well, I'm convinced the no-till attachment was the heavy-duty down pressure springs. Transfer the weight to the row unit. The colder itself, my colder's worn a little bit there, but if you look close, you won't see any of the colders on there. In the 80s, we pulled the colders off, except for one row, just to see if we needed it. Even running that shallow, it would pull up a little bit of wet sticky clay, ball up our depth gauge wheels, lose depth control, ball up our press wheels, and start having problems back there. Got rid of the colders, those problems went away. Now, people ask me, how much weight, how much down pressure do I need? I go, I don't know. Take the planter to the field in your planting conditions. Set the planter in the ground, get it all set, it's empty. Do it a couple weeks before planting time so you got time to fix it before planting season hits. Get it properly leveled, proper toolbar height, so your parallel links are running parallel to the ground there. And if you're gonna tilt it at all, tilt it tail down, never run nose down. Tail down to help the seed to soil contact close the seed bee. Blind plant, stop. Take a hold of the depth gauge wheel over here. That depth gauge wheel, you should just be able to slip it, slide it. If it's so firm in the ground that you can't budge it, you got too much down pressure. Usually that's not the problem, usually it's the other way. You spin it freely, it's not gauging pine depth or something's holding you out of the ground. For me, it was the colders. Got rid of the colders, I could penetrate a lot easier. Now, conversely though, if you can spin it freely, I need more down pressure, add more down pressure. And that's why I do it a couple weeks ahead of time. I got time to go buy heavy duty springs. I got time to find a cast iron to add in back. I got time to put a sandbag in the insecticide hopper if I have them. The other reason to do it a couple weeks early, it'll shake up your neighbor. He doesn't know the planter's empty. He sees you out in the field two weeks before him. But seriously, if you do it the day of planting, you're having problems penetrating, too many of us would call up the hired man and say, get the field color, go loosen that. No, take care of the planter. Again, I outlined this on the handout there. That colder, if you're familiar with John Deere bubble colder, I'm missing about a half inch of steel. It's worn a little bit. This producer's one run his colder a little longer than I did. You look at that, and I thought about my sticky clay soil in southeast Nebraska, and that wavy colder in a sticky clay cell would pull up so much mud, I'd ball up my depth gauge wheels, they'd be huge. I asked him, I says, how do you like no-till? And he says, I'm not a no-tiller. Well, why do you got the colders? I said, what happens when they hit wet sticky mud? He farmed in the sand hills of Nebraska, looked down at his sand, kicked it, and says, what's wet sticky soil? I says, why do you got the colders? He says, I have such abrasive soil, I couldn't keep discs and bearings on the planter to put, to totally put the colder on to take the wear, tear, and abuse. And again, that's what a lot of the early no-till planters were, was take wear, tear, and abuse away from the openers. Nowadays, they're beefing up the openers. Now, you guys are blessed up here with these mineral deposits that are 
rocks. <laughs> Colders might be good for you. Take wear, tear, and abuse from your double disc openers. If you got wet, sticky clay soils though, I don't like them. That's gonna be a trade off you're gonna have to decide on your own. But again, think about what's going on out there in the field. Side view, a farmer in Illinois. He says, well, I need the colder to put some air in the soil to get it to dry out. He's got poorly drained soils. I'm going like, well, you're putting tillage back in the system to dry out the soil. Yeah. Well, that same tillage, the colders up front are incorporating some residue while he's putting down his fertilizer, so he has to put residue movers on to kick that back out. And then he still has another colder to put more, more air in the soil. Now, I don't know about you guys, but at planting time, I'm not looking at drying out the seed zone. I'm usually wasting for a rain. Tillage does dry the soil. The bad news is it gets rid of the residue, gets rid of the soil structure, and it dries the all year round. The other thing is, look at his yellow suitcase, or yellow weights up front here. On the front of that planter, it's an eight row planter, he's got 12 John Deere rear wheel weights stacked on there to get all those colders in the ground. The more things you got going on the ground, the more weight it's gonna take. Our John Deere planters start right here with no attachments in front. We don't need to add a lot of extra weight in our planters to get them going on the ground. That double disc opener is bigger than the colder in front of it there. It'll cut more residue and it's sharper than that colder in front of it. So again, think about system. Now I had an opportunity, I was on grants through several years of my university career. 1983 to 1989, we had this huge grant from Exxon overcharge money that's being refunded. We were supposed to help farmers save energy. So one of the things was at that time we were saying, let's save some energy by adopting no-till. To be truthful, the fuel burned in tillage is not that much. The fuel burned to make fertilizer and apply it is huge. Five pounds of nitrogen is the same as one gallon of diesel fuel if you want to save energy. Watch your nitrogen rates, grow some nitrogen with some covers, and I can save more energy than I can by parking the disc. Now, I can save soil structure by parking the disc, I can save, build soil structure by planting the cover. So again, it's a double winner. But when it comes to energy conservation, what I did then is I went out and I found a producer like, I can pick on Dane because I know Dane's name. I found a producer like him and says, I don't care what you're doing now, let's take your, you, your skills and abilities, your equipment, your soils, can you no-till? And we split a lot of fields. I worked with 30 to 50 farmers a year from 83 to 89. This is one of them. It's an old John Deere 7000, the old five by seven toolbar. And he's out there planting no-till soybeans into dryland corn residue. His corn runs around 100 to 125, depending upon the year at that time. He's over 200 now with long-term no-till. He is, you'll be amazed what your planter can go through. Didn't add the first thing to it. Raised up the furrow openers to lean the stalks over so it's a little smoother ride. Should have pulled the one weed in front of that row, right? Tillage would have planted that volunteer corn. He didn't have the volunteer corn problems. The one weed, well, that was already growing when he sprayed his residual herbicide. He should have thrown in a little 2,4-D to take it out. Didn't need Roundup burn down. Again, back in 83, it was $100 a gallon. So again, you'll be amazed what your planter can do. Just try it. You'll say, well, how'd that look? His stand looked fine. Herbicide rained in and activated. This is before Roundup Ready Beans. This is back when post-emerge products were $75 an acre if you're doing a Baza plan, if you're familiar with that one. You had one product for small seed broadleaves, another one for large seed broadleaves, another one for grasses, another one for residual control, and you spend $75 an acre. When Pursuit came out at $40 an acre, everyone says, this is great, at $40 an acre. Roundup came out, and it's down to about $5 an acre in generic, and what do we do? We say, I'm gonna cut the rate and save some money. Wait a minute, you were spending $40 years ago and you're afraid to spend five now? Think about it. Again, reined in activated. post merge now makes it easier. I still like reined in and activated residuals. Our research farm, a couple of visitors from the United Kingdom. They says, well, it's springtime, are you planting? I said, I think our farm manager is planting. They uh, couldn't believe we're going through corn stalks that tall. And they were taking pictures of that, so I had to take a picture of them. But as they're standing there, they says, well, there's very few root balls rolled out. I go, yeah, there's a few. This is an area we had our corn variety plot in and we had eight different varieties that year and only one variety was a root ball holding together so much that it rolled out in the long-term no-till. And this is it. You don't see a lot of root balls rolled out. We were planting right down the old row. The paint on the underside of the tractor axles rubbed off because the corn stalks are that tall. Remember I said I leave the stalks taller? 
because I don't want them touching the soil. I want air movement down to the soil. Very little residue moves around when the wind blows because there's a snow fence every 30, 30 inches there to stop the wind. Leave your residue anchored and attached. Now when that planter runs it over and plant down the old row, we're planting soybeans in this field here, then the soil microbes can work on that residue. Now remember I said I had my long-term tillage plots. Well, that same spring we were talking about the corn root balls, I walked over to the no-till and I walked over to the disc treatment before disking, took hold of a corn stalk in each, pulled them out, held them up. Which one's which? The disc treatment is the huge corn root ball because there's no soil bollage there to digest the roots. The other one is the one digested up from underneath because of soil biology and good soil structure. We have found with our long-term no-till, good soil structure, heat coming from below, the soil biology creating heat because that respiration is going on, we can actually plant our no-till sooner than our tilled neighbors can because our soils are warmer. Because up here, I always hear, soils are too cold and wet. The till soils are. No-till ones, once you have the system working for you, you'd be amazed what you can go through. And again, it's long-term continuous no-till. That same field, there's a couple weeks later, this, I will admit, is a different variety. How many root balls do you see there? None. How much residue that was standing earlier is already being digested because now it's touching soil microbes? I'm starting to see some bare soil. And again, we got longer days down there, or sooner, I should say warmer days sooner. We get more biology activity because of more rain. I'm looking at how do I get more residue out there? How do I feed the soil biology so it doesn't digest my residue as much? Now I plant down the old row, a lot of people say plant between the rows. Then the planter doesn't have to handle all that residue. I go, wait a minute, if I go between the rows, now I'm asking a couple of rows of the planter to plant in last year's wheel tracks, and I'm asking the rest of them to plant into soft rows. How's that uniform? And you notice one row's run over on the residue? I now chew up my tractor tires real bad. That knows the problem, you can buy a, a stock leaner or something, spend some more money. You know what, I plant down the old rows because that residue there will never crust, it'll never wash out, it'll protect it, it won't dry out as fast. And I get a uniform seating condition because we never drive on our rows. We use controlled wheel traffic as well. But again, plant down the old rows, you get better soil biology. This one's interesting, made me think, it made the farmer think. This is a farmer who has 36 inch corn. He used to be for irrigation, he converted to center pivot irrigation. His pipes were on 36 inch rows, and that's why he stayed at 36 inch corn. He was planting soybeans, he thought 36 was too wide. He went to the local blacksmith, they built a quick hitch for his tractor that offset the planter five inches to the side. What he did was RTK, he's got the antennas on top there. The planter is real close, you know, shifted over this way. He's got a corn residue row from last year's corn is standing right here. He's planting five inches to the side. When he gets to the end of the field, he turns around and drives back in the same line at a half-rate population, planting five inches to the other side, and he's got a paired row of beans. Catch the concept. Now back up two years. Last year was corn, the year before was corn, five inches to the side. And you'll say, so what? And you can almost see it up front here. You can see stalks from last year, and you can see older stalks from two years ago. Well, as he planted down five inches to the side of this last year's residue, this row was going in what I call no man's land. There was no root there last year. The row on this side when he came back was into that row from two years ago. And you'll say, so what, that was two years ago. When his stand come up, his entire field looked like that. The one that was planted into the two year old root ball was growing better than the one planted in what I called no man's land. When he plants down the old row, it's even better yet. Because that's where your most soil biology was last year. Why would you go between the rows where the compaction is where you drove last year and between the rows where the least soil biology is there? Now granted, this is annual row crops. You put drill crops out there, you put cover crops out there, I got soil biology all over. I'll still plant down the old row, I'll still use controlled wheel traffic. Now, be truthful though, for corn on corn, until you get good soil structure built, we plant beside the row. Put narrow depth gauges on the planter so we can get closer to the row. We plant beside the row because depth control is so critical for uniform mergers on corn. And again, this is one narrow depth gauge wheel planted right beside the old row. The little tag there says April 10th. 
Again, this is an area of the state where April 20th is normal stand, starting date. We planted 10 days earlier and our corn's doing fine, no-till corn on corn, because the soil structure's there, a pop-up fertilizer's there. A lot of people say, don't you move the residue off to warm up and dry out that soil? Doing Beck says it best. Too many people try to make spring planting time warmer and drier, try to make the rest of the season cooler and wetter. The residue you push away at planting time is not there to keep the soil cooler in the heat of August. We leave the residue in place. Again, a lot of people say, well, here's second year no-till. He moved over, planted his corn, moved over again, planted his beans. He's starting to build some soil structure, starting to accumulate some residue, starting to feed the soil biology. He doesn't need a residue mover. What if for some odd reason he changed planting direction and went across? He's got warm, dry with no residue. He's got some extra residue there, so it's gonna be cooler and wetter. He's got warm, dry, cool, wetter. If you planted across, it's stand to be a little less uniform. Put a residue mover on to kick out the residue and make it all warm, dry. His yield will go up, and that's what the dealer will show you to convince you to buy the residue mover. I can agree, it's more uniform. If you have non-uniform residue distribution, or you don't have residue everywhere yet, maybe a residue mover to even things up is a good investment. If you have residue everywhere already, irrigated corn on corn, residue was everywhere. Ran the residue movers, ran them too aggressively, moved some soil. Every place we did this, we lost yield. Uh-huh. In Nebraska, the wind blows. Push the residue out at planting time, you had a black strip. Wind blows in a couple of days, some residue blew back, some did not. And like this first corn plant right up front here, was warm, dry, it come up quick. The next one is cool, wet, it's low, it behind. Warm, dry. This one actually leafed out under the residue. Everything I'm describing there is a less uniform stand. Our yields go down when we run residue movers. And we quit running residue movers about when they came out in the 90s. Yields keep going up. I had a company rep, and I won't say what company, but they said, well, you're just running the wrong brand. <laughs> they says, for your corn on corn, run ours, and you're going to be better off. And I go, I don't want to buy yours. He goes, well, I'll give you a set. Well, he gave me half a set, eight row planter, gave us four. I say, I won't name the brand. But you'll notice I had residue mover or a colder. What we did is we went down through the field, and this is irrigated corn on corn, center pivot irrigated, and we had flags set about every 200 feet in the field. We told the planter driver, when you get to the flag, either shift on the row or off the row, depending on what you were at the time. Planted a pass. Reconfigure it. Plant a pass. Reconfigure. Plant a pass. Now, I said only four rows. When you go down four rows, come back four rows, you had an eight-row sample for our combine. We ran no residue movers, no colder. Colder only, residue mover only, or the combination. On the row, off the row. We did it two years. One year with the red planter, one year with the green planter. The best stands were replanted beside the old row with no attachment. Our best yields, same place. Some people say, why would you even run a residue mover going down the old row? That's what's pictured right here in the front. This is just getting started no-till. We didn't have soil biology. This is where we're rolling out that root ball in the 90s. We had some seeds this deep, some seeds this deep, some seeds didn't even grow. Why would you even run a residue mover and go down the old row? We did it for years in Ridge Till, Nebraska, and we thought we were doing the right thing. Turned out it was wrong when it comes to uniform seed placement. Again, beside the old row. Here's from our long-term research project where our agronomy department said we're gonna raise 300 bushel corn in five years. This is year four, corn on corn, irrigated, right beside the old row. This one row is stunted a little bit. He's in the edge of the wheel track. You really wanna stun him, put him in the heart of the wheel track. This is the portion of the field where it was 44,000 dropped on 44,000. Combine, inter, or a knife, knife, snap and roll, processing the residue, no residue mover on the tractor, or on the planter. It can be done, you don't need all those attachments. They never made their 300. 289 was the best they did. Not bad. So again, you'd be amazed what your planter can do. Minimize that disturbance. The same slot you cut to put the seed in the ground is the slot the seedling would come up through. If I move the residue, cut a slot, and blow some residue back, you don't have a chance. So again, we quit running the residue movers, and yields went up. Now, on the research farm, for the researchers who do want to move residue, we use the floating type residue mover with depth bands. 
such that it moves only the surface residue, doesn't move soil. If you're moving soil, you got them set too deep. If they're the fixed ones, if they're moving, if they're turning more than half the time when you look back, you got them set too deep. And again, if you got non-uniform residue distribution behind the combine, this might be a fix to get you through. Fix the combine. And again, with good soil structure, good drainage, a lot of people say you can't plant early in the wheat stubble. Our soybean physiologists around Lincoln say May 5th is the day you start planting soybeans in tilled soils because the soils will finally be warm enough you can plant no till or plant soybeans. I planted it in 87 bushel wheat straw on April 15th, May 5th, my beans are up and growing ready. Long-term no-till, good soil structure. This is really tied up there. This is actually, make up the pointer here. This is depth gauge wheel one, the row is right here, depth gauge wheel two. Again, with our planter, minimal soil disturbance. Plenty of residue there to protect the row. Beans are up and growing, we're planting earlier, getting a longer growing season, getting better yields. Long-term no-till, you can do that. A tillage pan underneath there, you don't have infiltration. After a heavy rain, you might have cold, wet soils here. We don't. Oops, let's get back to the planter, the topic I was assigned. Cut and handle residue, double disc openers, single disc openers, and air seeders. Penetrate soil desired seeding depth. Down pressure springs to transfer the weight to where you need it or add the weight or whatever. Seed to soil contact, close the seed V. Remember I said I was out working with 30 to 50 farmers each year? In 1984, I hit this producer, had an old 400 cyclo runner planter. He had a sharp acroplant plant runner on, his on that planter. He said that acroplant plant runner can really make a nice seed V. That's why he loves the runner planter. He said, I can fill my insecticide hopper full of sand to get it to penetrate, and there's not much residue in soybean, residue covered fields, I can do that. He thought of step one, thought of step two. Step three, step four. Seed to soil contact, close the seed V. If you're familiar with the old International 400 cycle planter, it had a press wheel about this wide on it. Did nothing for seed to soil contact, close the seed V. And that's what his CV looked like, and you could check his population real fast. It rained that night. He got lucky. It silted in that loose soil that's there, and replicated strips across the field. No-till did 13 bushel per acre better than the disc field cultivate comparison next to it. Even though his planter failed, he switched to no-till. That summer, he bought a new planter, the new design that has something back there to close it. He loves no-till. So again, think of the steps. Where do you have your weakness? What do you need to change? You know, a lot of days, no-till first came out, John Deere says, well, we got these cast iron press wheels for no-till, for difficult closing conditions. Yes, they are for different closing conditions. They were invented for the guys who were no-tilling down there in Kentucky, southern Illinois and Indiana, where they're doing double cropping. They grow their wheat, the wheat's already dried out the soil, the soil had no structure because it was till. They don't have time to come in and do tillage to double crop their beans. So they got no soil structure, tough closing conditions, dry soil, they're putting beans in the ground, they need extra closing force, that's the cast iron. Now, spring planted crops is never designed for that. Spring planted crops, that sharp edge in the cast iron, especially in a wet clay content soil, it'll come down here and cut off two ribbons of soil that dry and look like ropes laying there. They don't work. Now, after I say that, some of you guys might have cast iron wheels out there. I say we don't. Cast iron wheels, I don't recommend. Now, Niall Wallenhopen, who's at the University of Wisconsin, did a study on sidewall compaction problems. Sidewall compaction, a lot of people say, well, that happens when you compact the sidewall by pushing the soil out and depth gauge wheels holding the soil down. That could be a problem. But think about the CV in back. If you fracture the CV around the seed, you're getting rid of sidewall compaction. Niall found out that about 90% of the people who had sidewall compaction problems were running cast iron press wheels and they're running them too aggressive and they're overpacking the soil and back and that's where they're causing compaction. Again, spring planting, I don't like the cast iron. Now, there's a lot of spoke closers out there. There are a lot of, all sorts of variations of those. Look in the back of a farm magazine, I've counted these little two by two ads. I think there's 26 different manufacturers now making some sort of closing wheel back there to replace the standard John Deere rubber tires. The main reason they are out there is people were planting too shallow compared to what this planter was designed for. Corn planters, this max emerge design of the angle closing wheels were designed when corn planting depths were two to three inches in the 60s. Until the soil, it's two to three inches. I'm gonna exaggerate here. This is one inch, this is two inches. 
open up the CV two inches deep. If you take those angle closed windows, extend them downward, they intersect imaginary point about two inches deep. As you open up the seed V, you drop the seed in there and then you squeeze down here at two inches deep. You squeeze, get seed to soil contact and until soil, some loose soil fell in here. We squeeze so deep that we bubble up some loose soil and from the road there in the late 60s, you can see the distinctive W and you knew what neighbor bought a max emerge with angle closing wheels because everybody else had a big wide press wheel there that left it flat. Now we go into no-till. Open up the seed V, drop the seed in there, squeeze it tight at two inches and no loose soil to bubble up. And the top of the seed V might be open and you panic. You grab the three-quarter socket for that bolt back there in the spring. Better yet, the new one's got a quick adjust handle. Open it up two inches deep, squeeze tight, squeeze tighter. There's still new loose soil to bubble up, but I guarantee you create sidewall compaction. The reason they put the quick adjust handle on there is to back off in wet soil so you don't overpack. Evaluate seed to soil contact separate from closing the seed V. They're two different things. Now, if you're having trouble closing the ZV, I got some tips. Now, think about, I use a corn planter designed to plant corn two to three inches deep, and I'm gonna go plant beans at one inch deep, or milo at one inch deep. Open up the CV, not two inches, but only one inch. Drop the seed in there, and press down here too. You don't even have a chance. If you went to cotton country or sugar beet country, Deer didn't sell this tail stock where the wheels are an inch and five eighths apart. They sold a different tail stock where the wheels are only seven eighths of an inch apart for shallow planting for seed to soil contact. Here's Milo at one inch deep with angle closing wheels. You don't have a chance. If you're having trouble with the roots not getting out of your seed V, plant deeper and squeeze down around the seed, not below the seed. Here's a producer had angle closing wheels, he said the soil is a little too wet, so I backed off my down pressure. That was mistake number one, he backed off too much. Mistake number two was he didn't have a proper seed V shape to get the seed to the bottom of the seed V. Mistake number three, he didn't close the seed V, but actually this one was forgiving because it rained on him. If you look close, and again, when I wake up the pointer here, here's the bottom of the seed V. The seed roots couldn't get out of the seed V because he didn't fracture the sidewall. He backed off the pressure too much. You can still seed the sidewall. And in fact, right there, you can still see the seed. Notice it's not on the bottom of the seed V. He didn't have good discs that was giving a good sharp seed V. I need the seeds at the bottom. The other thing, he didn't close it to the top. The seed V was open such that light got in there and where white turned to green is the soil surf, surface. No, it's where light penetrated. Now he planted deep enough he got by. If he planted shallower, he would have been dried out, wouldn't have worked. Plant deeper, you become more forgiving on some pro planter problems. Again, seed to soil contact is separate from closing the top seed V. If seed to soil contact's there, don't put more down pressure on it. Granted, this one's untilled. But if you're having trouble closing the seed V, first thing I look at is the planter properly leveled. This one's in tilled soil, it's running nose down. As it goes nose down, this pivot point of the press wheels lifts up. Now, as it lifts up this tailstock of the press wheel, come on, pointer, wake up. The tailstock of the press wheel then slopes downhill. As that slopes downhill there, the natural pinch that is in those wheels disappears. You say, huh? If you got a planter with angle closing wheels and it's raised up, tails down like this, look at the front of the wheels, look at the back of the wheels, the odds are it's closer together in front, further apart and back. If you're at it that severely nose down, it actually V pile and CV open. Pick up the tail stock. You'll see that relative angle changes to give you a closing. I'm going to show that tomorrow because I got a John Deere planter there, I know. So again, take a look at that. If your nose down, you're gonna have trouble closing the seed V. The other thing is if you're planting too shallow, it effectively raises that pivot point up, allows that tail to go down, you're gonna have trouble closing the seed V. Remember, it's designed for two to three inch planting depth. Plant deeper, the tail stock runs more level. Here's a field that took a six row planter and put two rows at one inch, two rows at three inches, two rows at two inches. Planted, I actually followed through to yield. 
On the far side, there's the one-inch playing depth. Press wheels didn't even work. You can't see it in this photo, but you could walk there and you can see the seeds laying there. These two rows here are the three-inch playing depth, and just barely visible is one of the two-inch playing depths. Again, that planter was designed with corn planting depths from two to three inches. I plant a lot the John Deere planter when it's right on a layer of residue. To get to that, my depth stop is on the last notch because I plant my corn down at three inches, three and a half inches deep. Plant deeper. Now, that is a separate problem than this one. Close the seed bee perfect the day you're planting. It's a wet soil. You get a little bit of a drying of that soil and you have no soil structure yet, the soil shrinks. CV cracks open. That's where some loose soil was nice to have. And that's why a lot of people have changed to these crumblers or spikes or something to create some loose soil. By creating some loose soil there, they can actually plant shallower and not worry about packing below the seed because they're not packing. Whoops, gonna have a problem. This one, notice the only place it opened up is where there was no residue. Where there was residue, it didn't open back up. Again, I don't run residue movers. I don't have that problem near as often. Once you have a well-structured soil, you don't have that problem near as often because the soil doesn't dry and crack like that. But again, get some loose soil there. Shaffert Fro V Closer. Ran three quarter inch to the side of the CV, three quarter inch angle, three quarter inch deep. It caved in some loose soil, such that the angle closed wheels could close it, and that loose soil didn't let it open back up when it dried. Paul Shaffert sold the heck out of these to guys in shrink swell soils in clay soils in Missouri. Sold the heck out of them to ridge tillers who pushed away the dry soil and residue and planted it in the wet soil. CV didn't open back up. Guys in no-till with good soil structure and good residue there, they've never seen a need for them. Didn't do anything for seed to soil contact, didn't do anything for closing the CV, just gave you some loose soil. Other ways to get loose soil. Martin Crumblers, Hard Martin was one of the first out there. It was part of the name, Martin Till System. Actually, originally it was the New Till System. The word tillage is back in there. Hard Martin's in Kentucky with 45 to 50 inches of rainfall. They were doing tillage at planting time to dry out the soil. Again, that's not my wish. Hard Martin, this is actually his planter on a field day is that I was at. Hard Martin says, well, I'm gonna take off the angle closing wheels, put these on to close that seed V and give you the loose soil so it doesn't open back up. I said, what about seed to soil contact? He says, no problem, Gene Keaton's a friend of mine. He sells this Keaton seed firmer. Took away the John Deere angled wheels that did both, put on the spokes and I lost my seed to soil contact. Again, think of the steps before you buy. Keaton seed firmer, I love a Keaton seed firmer for seed to soil contact. I love it to get all the seeds to the bottom of the seed V. I set up a six-year-old planter with a bunch of attachments across the back. I asked Howard Martin to send me a set of his. He sent me a Keaton seed firmer for free because he knew his was gonna fail without it. Again, it's firm that seed is separate from closing the seed V. The next row over is on Howard's planter with the Keaton seed firmer. He was showing the difference of with or without his spokes. Even then though, that was too much tillage for him. The patent now includes a drag chain behind to fill in those deep pot marks so they don't dry out too much. People ask me, do I need the drag chain? I says, well, that drag chain makes a nice surface there that's gonna crust on the next heavy rain you get. I don't like the tillage in the drag chain because you're on back into the tilled soils. I look for less aggressive closing the seed V. This is the Thompson T wheel invented by Keith Thompson. Keith is not in 50 inches of rainfall. He's in a shrink swell clay in Kansas. Shrink soil clay, he needs the loose soil. He went with little triangles rather than long fingers. The triangles are self-limiting on depth. They gave him the loose soil above the seed V. The Keaton seed firm, you can see the white up between there giving the seed to soil contact. Now that loose soil above the seed, it's not gonna crust. It's not gonna be a problem for his emerging plant. And it's not gonna crack back open when it dries. Now this picture was taken on a dry day. But again, before you buy the attachment, Keaton versus Thompson, for instance, Read where they're from, what problem did they have, what are they trying to solve? Howard Martin was trying to get rid of excess water, get rid of sidewalk compaction from wet soil. Thompson was trying to reduce opening up of the seed V. Didn't want to dry the soil. Again, which problem do you have? Which problem do you need? How much are you willing to spend? What are you trying to accomplish? The positive clothes from Schlegel Manufacturing. He's in a sandier soil. They said, we need to close that around the seed so it doesn't dry. So their bars do a little bit of seed firming, soil firming as well. 
don't really need the ketin perhaps because he has some soil firming. And again, some of these have firming, some do not. Notice though, he's got clean residue free strip there. Again, this is on Schlegel's planter himself. He runs the residue mover up front. I've seen where producers try running this without the residue mover and you get a long corn stalk laying there and you get about three bars of that wheel hitting the corn stalk at the same time. It doesn't do anything to close the seed bee. This is a sandier soil out there at Torrington, Wyoming. I know producer in Southeast Nebraska says in a wet clay, see that little piles of sand back there? In a wet clay, it dries and looks like dice. Hard chunks of soil. Again, what are your conditions? Furrow V closer, or I'm sorry, furrow closer, not the V in there. Uh, Copperhead ag. Now they're cheaper. They use your existing bearing, your existing hubs, and all you do is replace a rubber tire with a spoke tire. And it gives you some firming, gives you some depth control so it doesn't dry out the seed too much. It's a nice compromise. I know some guys in wet sticky clay say in a few rounds it builds up and you got a solid rubber tire anyway. What's your conditions? The Thompson wheel being real narrow has very little soil sticking surface. It doesn't build up. What's your condition? He's nodding. He told me he has Thompson's. But I'm cheap. I'm going to buy a good one, but I'm only going to buy half as many. Here's a producer I met that says, I'm going to buy the Martin because it gives me loose soil. I'm going to leave one standard John Deere wheel on to give me some soil firming, give me depth control so that Martin doesn't till out too much. And he started planting and that Martin, imagine the tines are actually an inch longer. In your mind, draw one inch on that tine and look where that Keaton seed firmer is. Think where your seed was. Every seed got picked out of the seed furrow. He said, well, I can make it less aggressive by taking a cutting torch and cutting one inch off at every point. He did this across the 16 row planter. It took him a little while, but he likes it now because it's less aggressive and leaves the seeds in the ground. I say plant deeper and don't till as deep. I'll leave the seeds in the ground. Better yet, read the directions. I said they're inch and five eighths apart. Martin says, if you put Martins on, you put a spacer on. There's a spacer on the Martin side. It moves the wheel out. They want them two and three eighths inches apart so you don't dig out the seed. Simple things like read the directions. Now, this is down by Gettysburg, South Dakota. If you're planting straight, no problem. If you're planting with a gentle curve to the right, that wheel, solid rubber wheel slips over there, no problem. Gentle curve to the left, the spoke wheel digs out the seeds. If you're planting shallow, plant deeper and the problem goes away. Again, I like planting three and a half inches deep, get a better root system. Dawn curve tying. We'll see that tomorrow on the John Deere planter. I already saw the picture of it. Again, this producer bought one rather than two. It's cheaper that way. The Dawn Curve Tine has some seed firming at the same time, the way the Dawn Curve Tine is, but it gives you the loose soil so it doesn't open back up. He's on a 20 inch planter here. He doesn't want too much soil disturbance. Again, different ways of doing it. If you ever visit Dakota Lakes Research Farm, Dwayne Beck's been playing with a lot of different attachments. This is one he found out of South America. It bolts on beside your standard John Deere wheel. Standard John Deere wheel gives you some seed to soil contact, gives you some depth control. The spokes there give you the loose soil so it doesn't open back up. And again, what do you need? Loose soil, firm soil, non-crusting soil? Again, depends where you're at. Side view, standard John Deere press wheels in back. Majority of our producers in Nebraska run the standard John Deere wheels and plant two to three inches deep because that's what the planter was designed for. Now, if you're gonna plant shallower, Spokes are probably the way to go. The bad news is the spokes dry out the soil. The spokes can warm the soil. You say, so? This seed warmed up, this one did not. Again, planting deeper, I get a more buffered soil temperature, I get more uniform emergence. This producer I've worked with for years, he was planting shallow and he was running his residue mover real aggressive. Every year he plants a half inch deeper and raises the residue mover up a half inch. He is now planting three inches deep and doesn't run the residue mover anymore. And that's what I tell producers like yourself when I say plant three and a half inches deep. No, if I've got this much soil and I got a root restricting layer here because of years of tillage and I put a seed three and a half inches deep, I guarantee after a heavy rain that soil is saturated and that seed will not grow. What I'll tell you is take whatever your planting depth is this year, plant another two rounds, half inch deeper next year. 
flag that, follow it through to yield, and I'll bet you the year after you're gonna do another half inch on two rounds, and the rest of the farm will be that first half inch. And like I say, after a couple of years, this pan goes away, the soil structure builds, and you'll start moving down, like I say, he's at three inches now. He still looks at me when I say three and a half. We like it. Now, Martin called that their mutter planter. They moved away residue on top, they did some tillaging back to dry out the soil. Here's my mutter planter. It's an old early riser, we replaced that, went from an 800 to a 900, we're up to a 955 now. We like the central seed hopper when it comes to plot work. I take off that seed drum, drop a variety bag in there, put it back on. Tractor driver never gets out of the tractor, plants the next plot, I dump it, put it on. You can do 100 plots in an afternoon. With a planter that carries seed in every row, you better have a man for every row to do plot work. But again, this is our mother planter. You can see some soybean residue out there full length. We don't run the chopper anymore. It's a foggy morning. A lot of people say you can't handle residue when it's wet. I say, sure you can. If you got good soil structure to support the residue and you got good weight in the planter to cut the residue and you got good sharp discs to cut it, no problem. It's foggy because this is a planting date study. This is the date circled. I was supposed to plant that day. It's foggy. It rained about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half the day before. Our long-term no-till soil structure such the water soaked away, we use controlled wheel traffic. You can't even see where the wheel tracks are, but it's firm enough there we can drive. We're not cutting. The fun picture is this one. Look at the depth gauge wheels. Ran an inch and a quarter a day before we're out planting on a silty clay loam soil. Very seldom do we get rained out because our soil structure is there, our controlled wheel traffic's there, our residue is there. Those wheels riding on residue, they never ride on soil. Now, hiding underneath there, and I say underneath there, this little white strap you see is a Keaton seed firmer to get the seeds to the bottom of the seed V. We got crumbler wheels on there to give us the loose soil so our clay, when it dries, doesn't open back up. And because we've got the loose soil there, it does build up a little bit on the press wheel. But so what? The seed's already placed at the right depth. Now, I said the red planter can go to the field earlier because it's got a little narrow angle of attack. Like I say, we are full two, three, four days ahead of any green planter in the neighborhood because of that narrow angle of attack. Now, for you guys that are supporters of the green, notice the weights I have on there for penetration. Notice I put a seed bag there so I don't scratch the green paint off of those green weights. We switched to 900 for a while. Rather than suitcase weights back there, there are sandbags from Menards, say we 70 pounds a piece back in the insecticide hoppers. Again, planting soybeans here, the planter looks a little bit different. In the background there, you can see an irrigation sprinkler on a steel fence post. It's a solid state irrigation system that was put in years ago where they can control every line separately. Well, there's a buried main line and coming up to each sprinkler is a water line. One of those water lines broke off the sprinklers like this and the planter driver thought it was just gonna do this when he hit it. No. You think we're worried about cutting residue? We cut black water pipe with our planter. You can see the tillage zone there where those crumblers are. You can see where the sprinkler line is, there's not as much residue because there's no crop row there. But again, planter can handle a lot. The crumbler on a Case IH design, here's one. Again, he's too cheap to buy two, we bought two. Case IH is mounted that way. We actually turned ours around this way. It does a better job of closing the seed V. Shown there is a Shaffert rebounder. As the name implies, it catches the bouncing seed, the rebound, puts it down to the bottom of the seed V. Now, the Shaffert rebounder used to be longer, used to firm the seed in the soil. Gene Keaton's lawyers called Paul Shaffert's lawyers and said, you know, ours is called the Keaton Seed Firmer. Our patent includes seed firming. You cannot claim you firm the seed. Paul Shaffert said, no problem. He took a nipper and cut the tail off. It doesn't firm the seed. He catches the bouncing seed, catches the rebound, puts it in the bottom of the seed V, and he says, that's part of our patent. You guys in Keaton cannot say you reduce seed bounce. Guess what, they both reduce seed bounce, but it's patent claiming. If you need seed firming, Keaton Seed Firmer, or there's a couple others showing up on the market now or there. If you want all the seeds to the bottom of the seed V, either one works. I'm to the point I won't plant corn without one or the other because I want seeds to the bottom of the seed V. The original, well actually the second generation, generation Shaffet rebounder, mounted the seed tube, it's already cut off, but it gets the seed to the bottom of the seed V. 
And again, the Keaton or the rebounder avoids this problem. Here's irrigated or dry land, corn on corn. It's been grazed too heavy. Very little residue there. Planted beside the old row, about four inches away. But notice this little plant here. This one's a little bigger. These two are real nice over here. This one's a little shorter. That's because there's too much seed bounce. Uniform seeding depth, that's where it'll pay for the rebounder or the Keaton, getting the seeds at the bottom of the seed V. That real shallow one, we actually dug it up. It was laying up on the side of the seed V in dry dirt until the rain came. That's why it's a weed. Again, plant deeper, good soil, get the seeds at the bottom of the seed V. That's why I love those devices. I love them for a better root system. These are two adjacent plants on a planter that had bounce problems going across the field. The big root, when you've looked where the seed was to the soil surface is two and a half inches deep, better root system. The other one with the seed bounce was only about an inch and a quarter. And you can see the yield potential, you can see the root system. Again, by going to three and a half, we get better roots, get better yields. I'm blessed today. Last time Jay saw me give this presentation, I almost had to quit here, because here comes the air seeders and drills now. I got time because he gave me two hours. Air seeders, drills. I've already told you everything. Cut and handle residue, penetrate soil, seed to soil contact, close the seed V. Right? You can evaluate any one of them. You know, a lot of people had shank drills. This is a hay buster drill. That shank couldn't cut the first stick of residue. Put a smooth, straight residue cutting colder out front there to cut the residue. That suction of that shank pulled it down to the soil. Big press was in back, no problem. Again, they called it no-till. Yeah, it was a little bit too much tillage in my opinion. Cut and handle the residue. Here's an air seeder that the front sweeps cut the residue loose nicely for plug the back sweeps. Oops. Again, there were some compromises as industry was learning how to do this. And the reason I say the compromises is we're cheap. When you start thinking of those four steps, think about row spacing. Seven and a half inch drill versus 30 inch row spacing. That's what I'm used to. There's four times as many openers. If I built a air seeder or a drill as bulletproof as a planter, it would cost 4X what the planter does. We're not willing to pay that yet, are we? Right now, the number one compromise is usually the seed metering. Number two comes somewhere else. Get rid of the sweeps, go to narrower points. This is a narrower point. Some shank seeders are out there even narrower yet. Some shank seeders are out there now with independent depth control on each shank. This one is what's the average across the entire frame and average of either the carrying wheels in front or the press wheels in back. The shank she she seeders were cheap because they were basically modified tillage equipment. As we're making true no-till seeders, we're seeing those go away. That's where the independent depth control is coming in. Independent down pressure, independent press wheels, independent extra money. Again, still not 4X a planter. Here's one place I think they take a big step backwards. You know the old John Deere drills, the LLs and such, similar. Had nice huge press wheels to give you seed to soil contact, close the CD. Some of these companies come to these little dinky things now that don't always work, don't always handle the residue. So again, think of the steps. But when it comes to a lot of the shank seeders that were out there, Number one, they were invented to take away the dry soil from wheat fallow, trying to get down to moisture to find moisture to plant in. Number two, they tried to create a furrow such that when it did rain, it concentrated the water in that furrow so you can get some seedlings up. Number three, if you're in an area with a lot of blowing sand, you got the seedling down here, the blowing sand didn't cut it off. Now as you go to no-till, you got residue everywhere, you haven't dried it with tillage, I don't have to hunt for moisture. I've got residue everywhere, I got less blowing sand, I don't have to hide it. I got residue everywhere, I got moisture everywhere, I don't need to make a furrow. Furrow drills are on their way out. Disc drills are there. And that's worldwide we're seeing that. Some areas slower than others. Australians are catching on, Canadians are catching on. But we're seeing disc drills showing up, taking over. But again, start thinking that 4X, that little disc drill that couldn't quite no-till, by the time you beef up four times as many openers, it costs you a little bit. Now, four. Here's an expensive one. This is AVEC coming out of South America. Now my flexibility is there. Independent depth control. Dwayne Beck has one of these at Dakota Lakes. He's even modifying it more yet. He doesn't think it works well here in the States. 
But here is an opener down in the bottom, an old dead furrow, an opener next to it up on the side and one on top. It's got flexibility there of 10 inches to 15 inches. John Deere and their air seeder, they're proud they got three inches. Again, we're gonna start paying more if it starts looking more like a planter. This is actually the back view, he's planting away from us. This row's already planted, that's the press wheel pressing it in. So again, we're seeing the changes. The changes are making air seeders and drills look a lot more like planters. When it comes to double or single disc, when it comes to parallel lengths, when it comes to down compression, when it comes to seed to soil contact. The same steps. Remember the four? I already showed you that one. Divide by four when it comes to residue flow. Multiply by four when it comes to weight. This is a demo I did about 84. Tie with the stubble drill, has a colder in front of that. They got standard openers in back. Their idea to make no-till drill was put a colder in front and the standard opener would work. No, let's make the opener no-till to start with. Well, he started planting soybeans in the corn stubble there and every soybean seed was on top of the ground. The dealer jumps off the tractor, runs back there and these down pressure springs back here he just tightened each one up. As he tightened it, he says, I can give you 300 pounds per row down pressure. And I'm sitting there in my head, 300 pounds per row times 24 openers on a 15 foot drill, seven and a half inch spacing is 7,200 pounds. I says, what's your drill weight? He says, oh, 5,000 pounds. Okay, 5,000 pounds this way and 7,200 pounds pushing this way. And that dry wheel is about a foot off the ground. Ask for volunteers from the audience. And our safety engineer retired, so he has not seen this picture. Don't not recommend this. But here was a dealer trying to sell a piece of no-till equipment who didn't understand no-till. Good news is a lot of those guys have been thinned out. So again, think about it. Here is the demonstration about the same time this dealer said, I understand no-till. He's stacking on a few suitcase weights. His three-point mounted drill you can no longer pick up. They changed into pull type. And basically three point drills disappeared when no-till took off because you could not pick up and handle that weight safely. Went to pull type. Now I can do a lot more, a lot more flexibility out there. Uh, that's the Marlis drill. Here's a side view of a later Marlis, a little narrow colder, that narrow colder to cut and loosen the soil, cut and root residue because they had a little 12 inch disc there. A little 12 inch disc didn't work in no-till. When it comes to diameter, diameter is directly related to depth. The 12 inch disc was designed for grass seeding at a half to an inch deep. A 12 inch disc running a half to an inch deep will give you residue cutting at the soil surface. Now, plant down at three inches deep, it'll give you a bulldozer because it can't cut residue. So you went to a larger diameter opener. Now, let's say the corn planter. It's got 15 inch disc, the average corn planter. 15 inch disc at three inch planting depth has a good residue cutting angle. At a two inch planting depth, less residue cutting at one inch, I can guarantee you're gonna hairpin every stick of residue there is, because there's no angle to cut. If you're hairpinning residue, you're planting too shallow for the diameter opener you have. Corn planter's designed for two to three inch planting depth. The new Agco planter, the 9000 series, went to 16 inch disc and they proudly say they can plant four inches deep and maintain residue cutting angle. They could plant their beans deeper by larger residue cutting angle. So again, think about operating depth. For hair pinning, plant deeper. Hair pinning goes away. Get rid of the colder. Spend extra money on bearings. Reinforce things. This is the hay buster of a mirror drill. It's starting to look more like a planter. Parallel links. It's starting to cost more. It's still not quite four x a planter. Crust buster, staggered openers, heavy duty down pressure springs, parallel links. Notice the drive wheels are almost off the ground. Crust buster there, I mean the middle notch and the down pressure, this is one we used to rent. Middle notch down pressure is 250 pounds, times 22 openers on that one, and I was a little light. We bought a crust buster because we liked the way it worked. We had to add some weight to it. We got 24 openers because we're on seven and a half inch spacing rather than eight. And the back notch is 500 pounds. 500 times five, 100 per row times 24 rows is 12,000 pounds. Ship weight on that thing was only 7,900. We added a bunch of weight. We added flat steel in the drawbar. We added flat steel under the drill box in the tubes. We added 20 suitcase weights. We bought markers. Not so much we needed markers, but the markers weighed 800 pounds. 
We put a fertilizer tank on it and make sure you always carry some weight with you. We added over two tons of weight to that drill. Our 7,900 pound ship weight got over 12,000 pounds and that drill works. Good news is, Crestbus has been watching what I'm doing. That replacement model, that same model now, a replacement version of it, already comes pre-filled on all the steel with punch outs. It weighs 11.8 now ship weight. Customer now doesn't have to add the weight. Now yeah, wait a minute, I still added my 20 suitcase weights because I got some summer demos I do in dry soil that's hard. I wanna make sure it works. And again, one of the worst things you can do, and I'm gonna say you being NRCSers, is go do a summer demo in conditions that aren't quite normal and have a failure, and I can guarantee you half of you will walk away and say it will never work. I over-designed because of my educational programs. That extra weight there, that drill goes in the ground, the markers are there, you can see where 800 pounds comes into play. Here's suitcase or uh, donut weights in the back. This is my older one. We're planting wheat there into soybean residue, minimal soil disturbance. We run that drill nose up, tail down, just like the planters, get minimal soil disturbance. Could be planting cover crops there, but we do our wheat seeding immediately after winter wheat, immediately after soybean harvest. We don't do spring wheat. Now for cover crops, I use the same drill. For cover crops, there's other ways of doing it. We got some guys flying it on. Check your crop insurance when it comes to these alternate methods. Crop insurance in Nebraska, because of moisture limitation, is if your crop is mature, cover crop will be no problem. If you fly it on before it's mature, they technically can cancel your insurance because of the moisture stress. Unless you're irrigated like this guy is. If you're a dry lander, you gotta wait a little longer. We like to fly it on when the leaves are about 10% yellow. If you do it sooner than that, you don't get enough light penetration. If you do it later than that, you get too many seeds on top of the leaves. And here's the sandy dryland field. So right already growing there, protect the sandy soil as he's harvesting his beans. That farmer said the next year his corn did 20 bushel per acre better where that residue was. Again, the sands without residue got hot in the summer with the extra residue from the cereal rye there, kept it cooler, kept it healthier, and the residue reduced evaporation. In the sandy soil, the poorer soils, his, or his return to the cover was much higher. This guy says, I can't hire an airplane. I got a fertilizer spreader. Again, he's a little past 10% yellow, spinning on his cover crop seed. We got some guys doing that. Now, a lot of guys ask, what about into corn? One of the problems with the corn is, as the corn plant is standing up there, there's very little light penetration. You gotta wait longer. Or if you go out there with an airplane, too many seeds get caught in the whirls and never make it through the leaves down to the ground. That's why I appreciate these rigs like Higgy's got here. Oh, I forgot, I slipped in the helicopter. Helicopter versus airplane. We got guys in Nebraska who love this. If you live more than 10 miles from the airport, the airplane to refill a seed has to go back to the airport. Helicopter does not. This guy has, it's about 70 foot cable there, it's a hydraulic drive down there spinning, carries 800 pounds of seed and spins about 70 foot wide pass. 800 pounds of seed. At the rate they're putting on for this project, they're putting out a ton for 40 acres, a one ton tote. 40 acres, it took three loads of the helicopter. Well, what the helicopter did, never had to return to the airport. These guys went out with their truck they unloaded these totes at these fields all day Monday. Tuesday noon, the helicopter showed up, started spreading. Never had to return to the airport, never landed. He hovered, set the cedar down, they refilled, and he went on. They did 1,300 acres in one afternoon because they spent the day before setting up. Well, when it comes to getting covers out there, erosion control on these rolling hills in Northeast Nebraska was their main purpose. They weren't even looking at soil health, they're looking at erosion control, and they had a natural resources district paying the covers and paying the airplane, or paying the helicopter or airplane because the community erosion control is so important. Now the Hagee commercial, I say commercial. I, we thank them for their support, thank them for bringing their machine. Uh, Jay's gonna have them talk later. But again, here's a picture from, in, uh, seeing the cover here. It's got the drops on there. The drops are not installed in this machine, by the way. The drops get you down below the leaves when you're growing in corn, so you don't have all the seed hanging up there. And again, it's a nice way to get covers established. This one also has what I call the hubcaps on, so you get less vegetation into the wheels. This one does not, it's on display back here. My covers, I put in the ground with the drill. 
I like the crust buster drill because depth controls in back. I like standing residue. Here is uh, seeding covers into standing corn stalks. This is about 200 bushel corn the day of harvest. I like it to build soil biology. I'm going to talk more about soil biology this afternoon. So I'll show you the same shot this afternoon, but more details. But it leaves residue standing. After wheat, that's where I do most of my cover work because I got a longer growing season. This wheat stubble is already seeded to a cover. The crust buster drill, the opener slide down between the standing residue, it's already seeded. I just follow the combine wheel tracks. Camaro, I use controlled wheel traffic. I usually use about a 14 way mix into my wheat stubble. A couple of warm season grasses, a couple of cool season grasses, a couple of warm season legumes, a couple of cool season legumes, a couple of brassicas, a couple of pollinators, a couple of fun things. My fun thing this last year was okra. Okra seeded this time. I got all the okra I can eat by frost. But again, 14 way mix for diversity, and you can see the diversity out there. You can see the flowers out there. You can see some carbon out there. You can see some nitrogen out there. I'm not growing it to grow biomass to feed cattle. I'm growing it to feed the soil. Now, to feed cattle, that's a thin stand. Again, I treat grazing or forage different than cover. I'm experimenting with different things. This is a six-way legume mix. Wait a minute, I can buy nitrogen at the co-op. Here's a three-way carbon mix. Can't buy carbon at the co-op. 15-inch spacing, I just put refrigerated magnets over every other opener in my drill. Left the wheat stubble standing. And this is in 2012, the drought year. Everybody says, we are too dry for cover. I got that much cover growing after wheat harvest in a drought. No, grow something, feed the soil. Pick a little bit on the green here. I say pick on it. Single disc opener, depth control beside it. I hate that for covers because it runs over too much residue. This depth wheel up front, row behind it is between them, runs over the same residue and your field might look like this. In the spring plant and soybeans where we want flattened residue for erosion control, that might be great. For planting wheat in the fall where I want standing residue to catch snow so I reduce winter kill, I hate that. Again, depends upon your situation. If you got that problem, rearrange some openers. Front left to rear right. This step the wheel runs over the residue and puts a row on this side. This step the wheel runs over the res same residue and puts the wheel on this side, a row on this side, and the residue in between is not run over. And there's a lot of guys in corn bean country, they do that to leave their corn stalks down and the depth gauge wheels don't bounce over the corn. Takes a little time. Go to a narrow depth gauge wheel, leave more residue standing. I got a lot of producers doing that. Go to a narrow depth gauge wheel and rearrange the openers. This is on Dwayne Beck's drill. No depth gauge wheel and re swapping those openers. He's actually five by 10 now, averaging the seven and a half. But he's got a gap through there where a lot of residue is still standing. Again, we can do that. Sometimes you want to flatten the residue. He's planting into a wheat cover crop, high carbon, no cattle. Next spring he's planting soybeans. He wants that drill to flatten the residue. That's his cover crop roller. Closing the seed V, seed to soil contact. Here's the fin, fertilizer option, crumbler, give you some loose soil. Narrow press wheel. I highly recommend the narrow press wheel. Deers was too wide. It was designed for tilled soils, go narrower. Again, a crumbler behind, this has to be the Thompson T wheel. This guy has the narrow press wheel, he's got a wider press wheel, he's got the cast iron, he's got the spokes. I'm going like, which one do you like better? He says, what soil in spring planting? I like the spoke with the narrow press wheel. Dry soil, I like the cast iron. Till soil, I like the wide wheel. And I says, well, you're right about one fourth of the time. <laughs> but again, which do you need? What are you in? The narrower wheels are flexible usually. So when you're going around curves and contours, it stays on your seed V. This one I just throw in, it's just fun to see. One of these openers is worn out. The rest of them are shot. Should have been replaced years before. The one on the far end is worn out, the rest of them are shot. Take care of your air seeder, guys. It's the same as a planter. You have one chance to put the seed in the ground. This is the picture from about eight miles north of here. Then a depth gauge wheel. See the rock down below? Again. We're not quite as bulletproof as we could be because we're not always the same. Take care of your equipment. Add some weight, maybe. You know, Deer says, I got good down pressure, 425 pounds per row on that old 750. That's if you put weight on the back. If you have weight problems, the place that really shows up on side hills. 
If you don't have enough weight in the back, those wheels in back don't grip the soil. As you go on a side hill, you get side hill drift. As you get side hill drift, these openers that are supposed to be at seven degree angle is now 14 degree angle downhill, disky, and zero degree angle uphill, and it's not placing the seed in the right place. Put weight in the back to reduce this problem. Here's a farmer put on all four corners and on the wings. Hint, if you got the 30 foot version, the little two and a half inch cylinder works fine. If you got the wider versions, a lot of guys are switched out to four inch cylinder to get more down pressure on those openers. The four inch cylinder, good improvement on the wider drills. Producer from Australia, he squeezed his down to six inch spacing. More openers per foot of width. Look at his collection of weights. Again, on the back. I say the back, deer's weight bracket's on the front. Deer's weight bracket, when you think how they're swinging our mounts, why do you need weight up here? No, you need weight back here. Put the weight in the back. Again, remember the wings as well. Weight bracket's on the back. Case IH, weight on the back. This is a 30 foot drill with 36 suitcase weights in the back. He does some custom work. He gets some tilled ground that doesn't have structure yet. He put on 600 gallons of water. Now they're staggered. He empties the water out, the drill folds up, they're all in a row. He gets out to the custom farmer. He unfolds it, blows the water back in the tanks. It doesn't transport the weight. Safety going down the road. It doesn't need the weight, doesn't blow the water in. But again, weight, make sure it works. We got some guys looking at 15 inch wheat. You go, huh? Half as many openers, half the weight. This is 15 inch wheat planted with the Kinsey planter. There's plates available now to meter wheat with some of these air planters. And again, we're seeing that some with cover crops. Again, 15 inch planter here. See the suitcase weights. The water tanks on top are actually weight fertilizers in the front tanks. I like what I call the even row planters though. That first one was an eight by seven. You got some rows in the old corn row, you got some rows in the wheel track, some rows in the soft row. With the even row planters, you leave the residue standing and you put a row on each side of the wheel track. He's ready to pull me off here. He's ready to eat. I had clothes on the one drill I've never had to add weight to. This is the yielder drill. It used to be called the pioneer drill. These front openers are the fertilizer openers. There's anhydrous cold flow, there's dry, there's liquid. It puts fertilizer between paired rows of the openers there and each set of those beams are on rollers there and there's hydraulic cylinders hiding in there. And those hydraulic cylinders then give you all the down pressure you need. You can see the hydraulic cylinder ram like right here. And again, it goes on this roller. Put some scale to that. That front opener is a 20 inch disc. The seat opener is a 24 inch disc. There's a little bit of size to it. All their fertilizer, no tillage. Sell all that equipment because you need the money to buy this sucker. 20 foot wide, listed for $180,000, as this one's shown is 240,000. Highest price no-till seed I've ever seen, this is back in 1981, $1981, 240,000. Cheapest farming system I've ever seen when you think of systems approach. Yielder is out of Spokane, Washington. They do peas, lentils, garbanzos, spring wheat, winter wheat, oats. They put a corn seed meter on there from International. Do sunflowers, do pick nine to crops you can grow, 10 crops you can grow. 20 foot wide. You can plant 1,000 acres, switch to different crops, plant another 1,000, plant another 1,000. They targeted 10,000 acre producers. One tractor, one drill, no fertilizer equipment needed. Again, one pass, because you got a broad crop rotation. Now $24,000, or $240,000, was only $24 an acre on a 10,000 acre producer. Keep one tractor, they recommend 500 horse, pull it at 10 mile an hour, that's how you cover 10,000 acres. Rent a drill, you pay what? $15 an acre. Give it back after a year and a half. This one was paid for in a year and a half. And they're still running. Cheapest farming system I've ever seen. One man, one tractor, one drill on a per acre basis. Now, just like you're sitting there going, I had one farmer raise his hand and say, I'm no telling for $60. $60. What attachment did he buy? What attachment did he buy for $60? He goes, nope, the planter cost me $60 on a farm sale. 
Those people over there at the NRCS office, sorry, he's so in our conservation district. NRCS, pick on Susan. They said, my conservation compliance plan in 1985, I have to no-till into my soybean residue. My conservation compliance plan had terraces, had alfalfa in the rotation, had corn in the rotation. I could do some minimum tillage because I had other practices on the land. Systems approach, think systems approach. The only place he had a no-till was bean residue. He said that runner can't cut the first stick of residue, stay off the old row. Can't penetrate the wheel track, stay out of the wheel track. Seed to soil contact, close the seed V with loose soybean residue was no problem. He thought of the four steps. I guarantee every one of you are between the $60 here or $240,000 on that other one. You decide where, think of the steps. With that, sorry, no light for lunch. Crop Watch, our crop production crop study newsletter, published at University of Nebraska. It's also our extension portal for all of our crop production information. Uh, that's uh, Mike Hubbs, he used to be the national agronomist for NRCS. We had him at a field day in Nebraska. All, when you guys go to a field day, look below the soil. Look at the soil. Too often we look at the crops above. This is a must for all our field days. We dig a pit. We look what's going on below the soil as well. With that, I'm around this afternoon. I'm going to have another presentation. Question and answer is this afternoon. Or you can catch me during lunch if you have something burning in your mind. <laughs>